Okay, we're live. Econo Boy, you were late. I was not. I was here at 6. That's when we, uh, or, or 7 p.m. EST. That's when we agreed, I thought. <laughs> well, yeah, but you got to have like a, like a few minutes beforehand to say hi and introduce you to Lilith, my co-host. Oh. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> I see it. I see how it is. <laughs> so, how, how's, how's everyone doing? I'm making introductions today. I'm, 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 I'm the kingmaker in this conversation. Because Econo Boy and Lilith are both friends of mine. And now you get to talk to each other. There we go. Yeah. I'm I'm uh looking forward to it. It should be fun. I mean, you know, I assume that Lilith is a pretty good pretty good person. For the most part. <laughs> well, I mean I am a perfect judge of character. I hope I'm a good person. Some people I... say to think I'm like worse than Hitler. I've heard that a few times. Really? Worse yeah. than Hitler? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I've heard some people who are on the extreme left call you, call you a fascist because you're a libertarian, and then I've heard That's some people, true. I've heard some people on the right, um, call you a degenerate because you're trans. So, I've heard, I've heard both of it about you. Mm. Yeah. Yes. That tends yeah. to be how it works. I heard someone the other day say that, basically, like, right libertarianism is just fascism, and I don't. I guess I don't understand the argument, right? I mean, I, I, I guess if you think like markets are opp oppressive or something, like I don't, I don't know what the, <laughs> you know, I don't know what the argument is. Um, um, I don't I know. I'm, I'm, I'm you... just a sock them guy, so I'm, I'm the real fascist anyway. Go... So <laughs> I can give you the <laughs> argument basically, because I've read some people who are like authoritarian, right? Like, like, like the neo reactionaries. I've been reading some of their stuff, and the argument is basically that. Uh, a, a libertarian society cannot function unless it everyone has a buy-in into it, and it's a high-trust society. And the best way to get a high-trust society out of a low-trust society is to purge it of all of the various separate elements. So if you have, for example, an, ethnic, an, an ethnically homogenous society, it's much more likely to work on libertarian principles. So... Oh, oh God. <laughs> That's... <laughs> So in order to f achieve freedom, you have to uh, first oppress the shit out of everybody and make uh, make everyone the same. Yeah. yeah, yeah, make everyone. Make it's everyone just funny. I've never, I've never heard the argument. People always say that about like left of center ideas. Mm -hmm. Oh well, you know, you can't have a national health system in the U.S. because of you know all the black people and Mexican <laughs> people that live there. Um, <laughs> which is basically the argument. I've never heard that for libertarianism, but it's nice to know that people, uh, you know, every ideology ultimately can be criticized by people that, I guess, want a more homogenous society, let's say. Mm -hmm. So right libertarians get a lot of, uh, lots of hate rep. Uh, some of it is deserved, some of it not so much. I feel like the comparison between libertarians and fascists is a bit much it's like the whole point of libertarianism is supposed to be for free freedom and liberty yeah and um <laughs> there are some fascistic elements within the within like the people who call themselves like liberate um that's definitely not something to be ignored but like from like most of the little the lib right people I've talked to, they are just like, "Hey, you, I'm cool with whatever." You just like, I, I just don't think it should be illegal. And um, yeah, most libertarians I meet, they're like just dude weed Lamau, and that's 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 like the extent of their politics. <laughs> they just want to be left alone to like get yeah. high. And it's like fair enough, can't argue with that, you know. And I had a also, couple of friends will, that uh, they'll take my property. Yes. Don't take your house. I had What's a that? couple of friends that went to the Libertarian National Convention in 2016. And I was like, oh, what was it like? And it was a couple of my guy friends. And they were like, well, it was like 100% dudes. There were no <laughs> women at all in Wait. the whole like convention. It was <laughs> not very e rare. Not even Asian um, wives? There's usually Asian wives along for the ride. No, it was like, they said the ratio was like 50 to 1. <laughs> like Jesus. it was a very small percentage of women. <laughs> And it smelled really, like, really, really like weed. Like, everyone was smoking a lot of weed 
at the Libertarian National Convention in 2016. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand. I want to like, say it was even. No, was on, it even? On. I think it was in Denver. Was it not? I, I want to say it was in like a legal place. No, it wasn't. It was in Florida. Well, apparently these people were illegally smoking marijuana. Um, <laughs> and nobody cared <laughs> because the fucking room was like a whole, the whole room was like hot box, basically like the whole convention center or whatever. So mm. as they should, <laughs> as they should. So I, I have heard like the inverse argument going from like libertarian socialist to, 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 I guess the, the Stalinist or the, the Marxist Leninist or whatever. I've heard that argument. And that one seems to be a bit easier to kind of parse out where the idea is, you know, if, if, if you have to redistribute, and steal people's property, you're going to have to be a, become authoritarian to do it. And it's like, okay, I, I can see that. But the, the libertarian to fascist pipeline, is you have to work that one out a little bit more and read some read a few things. But ha- having read some of these crazies on the right, they're, man, they're, it feels like everyone who's not a liberal right now is just insane. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess so. I mean, people, people... I guess rightly to some extent call me a liberal because I'm a uh, I'm a left capitalist. You know, I st- I, st- I still think capitalism is a decent enough mode of production, and I but you know I'm not a you know I don't think we should kick all immigrants out of the country and stuff, right? You know, I'm pretty much a standard Democrat. Um, so it, it seems that way sometimes. Um, listen, listen. I think that the listen. Least, boy, we oh, need yeah, to pri- we need to privatize ICE, okay? Pure, pure oh, yeah. free market, Privatize all of it. it. Yes, we'll set out bounties. <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be we'll be pure bounties. and Kapistan. What the fuck? Now? And Kapistan. Oh, my man. goodness. <laughs> no, that'd be a terrible idea. I mean, you know, it, I don't know. It seems like, from my perspective as as a Democrat, it seems like the it seems like the Republican Party, and I've seen a couple of studies that have backed this up that the Republican Party has gone like farther to the right than the democratic party has gone to the left um i can see that and it feels that way uh on the ground as well and um it doesn't really seem like socialists are getting a lot of electoral success in general right so um you know it's it seems like the the socialists the online socialists and marxists are still pretty well segregated uh, to Twitter spaces, whereas, you know, there's people like Marjorie Taylor Greene and, you know, Lauren Boebert who are who are actually winning, yeah. you know, win, winning elections. So the, the, the populists, the populists on the right seem to have won their takeover of the GOP. Meanwhile, like the Bernie bros kind of failed at their populist takeover of, of the Democrats. So I know what you mean. Oh, and, and even like yeah. even like the like, like AOC was a lot more extreme five years ago than she was today. You know, like she, she's she's like moderated a lot, I think, because just there's a there's a general yeah. unpalability regarding socialist ideas for, for regular people. Yeah, I mean, I think that 2020 was a wake up call for a lot of the squad um, because mm-hmm. 2020 was I mean, you know, it, it, like 2018. Sure. Um, I think 2018 could be characterized. I think 2018 could be characterized almost more so by anti-Trump sentiment than the actual election where he won because he wasn't even on the ballot in 2018, right? Yeah. Um, like, it seems like 2018, a lot of the midterm route that happened to Republicans was basically like, we don't fucking like Donald Trump, right? We're going <laughs> to vote for Democrats. And um, whereas, um, it, and so in 2020, it seemed like there was a lot more, like, uh, you could say, organic potential for the democratic party to move and it seemed like a lot of the ideas that progressive democrats started espousing especially when it came to defunding the police were just wholly unpopular amongst uh basically most independents and frankly most democrats and um they were that unpopular ended up getting... even amongst black people too like well yeah i mean that that as well i think it was like 80 percent of black people wanted like either the same or more police to patrol their neighborhood. And, um, and so a lot of, you know, a lot of Democrats like basically 2020, instead of the Democrats expanding or keeping their sizable lead, it was, um, um, but you know, they ended up shrinking. I believe that the Democrats ended up having a smaller margin after 2020 than in 2018. And so, I mean, yeah, those, those ideas just seemed to 
really uh, well, basically be liabilities. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. Orange yeah. Like, and it, that's what I'm saying. And in the future, that's why I think that a lot of the more extreme, like, you know, squad type rhetoric has been focused a little bit less so on stuff, especially regarding the police. Like, defund the police seemed to die basically right after the 2020 election maybe after 2021 like i don't really hear a lot i don't hear any basically minneapolis did not silver you fucking oh, dev your audience why am i watching your chat minneapolis did not vote to abolish <laughs> their police force they voted against that <laughs> referendum because what we're saying is that's not thanks possible. for the money buddy I'm totally misinformed, silver. <laughs> yeah thanks for wasting your two dollars you freaking ah ah anyway the point is <laughs> what I was trying to get at is that I don't think a lot of that rhetoric has survived 2022. I don't see a lot of Democrats campaigning on it. It seems like Democrats now, they're campaigning on, like, you know, abortion rights and basic economic issues, right? Inflation um, and stuff, and yeah. I think that's... Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's part partly emblematic of the failures of, you know, super-duper far-left. Uh, I don't even want to call defunding the police far-left. Like, I guess... I don't know if that's necessarily a left or a right thing, but, like... Because a lot of libertarians would argue for defunding the police, right? Mm -hmm. Like have private yeah. police or whatever. But um, it's just like that more radical idea of defunding the police or getting rid of the police force. Just that, stuff like that just doesn't seem to, you know, that doesn't seem to 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 jive with current mainstream sort of democratic voters. So, yeah, I mean, you still see a cab in people's Twitter bios. That's about it. Yeah, but again, that's that's what I'm saying. Like a lot of these ideas with regards to like left of center. Um, um, you know, the city council didn't vote to abolish the police silver. They voted for the fucking <laughs> referendum to go forward and the people voted it down. So you're wrong. Thanks for another $2 to Dev. I didn't get any of that. Goodness. <laughs> Keep donating money to, to say things that are wrong, silver. Um, but anyway, um, uh, no, I, I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think it was, um, I don't think that kind of stuff was, uh, you know, was particularly popular. That was kind of my whole point is that it seems like a lot of these more radical, sort of fringe left of center ideas are kind of segregated to Twitter and it doesn't seem like most mainstream Democrats are adopting them. Whereas, you know, you do see a lot of mainstream Republicans adopting, you know, oh, the 2020 election was stolen and fraudulent or, um, you know, you see like mainstream Republicans accusing like Joe Biden of being like a pedophile and stuff like that. <laughs> um, just I like really conspiratorial one, but... shit. <laughs> I mean, I, I th honestly, yeah. I, I have a feeling that Joe Biden may, maybe might be suffering from some early dementia. I do think that that might be the case. Um, but pedophile, I haven't heard pedophile. Is that a is that is that a no, new yeah. lore? Well, well, some of the well, I think Joe Biden's been accused of being a pedophile for a while because of um, like he's really old and he also there's photos of him like oh the hair sniffing that's know, right yeah the yeah. hair yeah. stuff and stuff like that and. Like weird, yes. Pedophile, no, is kind of where I'm at on that, and that seems pretty reasonable. Um, yeah, it's like a nineteen, it's like a nineteen fifties thing, of, yeah. Yeah, and a lot of Republicans are adopting, or at least trying to adopt, adopt the talking points of, um, you know, uh, Democrats are groomers. They're they're groomers because they want to teach sex ed to like you know, elementary school kids or whatever, right? Um, which. Uh, you know, that doesn't seem to have resonated a lot with most voters, I don't think. Like, it doesn't seem like most um, people are of no, that line, but I've seen many. Uh, I feel like. Yeah, I've seen a lot of Republicans say that, though, which is unfortunate. It's, it's a little bit of a tangent, but I feel like teaching sex ed, like, could actually prevent grooming, don't you think? Like. In some ways, I think I mean, so, I yeah. think so, because, you know, I'm because, not. Like, you know. Because people, kids... people think. I was going to say, people, when people think like sex ed to, um, um, yeah, when people, when people think teaching sex ed to a first grader, they think, I feel like they're imagining like, we're showing oh, yes, them kids, porn they, and the yeah, today porn. we're going to watch porn, you know, we're going to pull up browsers.com and start watching it. You know, we bought a premium account just for this purpose. Like, no, that's not at all. <laughs> watching HD and 3D. Yeah. Or like you scale you... glasses, children. Mm. Yeah, you, you scale the sex ed to the age of the of the person, mm -hmm. right? So, like, yeah. a first grader is probably just going to learn, like, this is what a penis and a vagina is. This is what they do. Um, this is how you should react if, like, an adult ever tries to touch you there or something like that. I mean, th this is the type of sex ed then that you would reasonably teach a first grader. And that's, like, you said, I mean... Kids that penises exist. 
Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. From what I've read, that kind of sex ed does prevent uh, abuse because yeah. a lot of people. I mean, we've like, we've well, either met or heard of stories where people before I comment, say like, you know, how old oh, is yeah, grade no, one? How, how old is grade one before I comment? Six to seven years old, maybe in a couple more years. Sounds about right. Yeah. Maybe 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 I don't maybe know. I mean, like nine abuse... years old, other than seven. I mean, look, I, I think a lot of kids, you know, whether we want to admit it or not, you know, you're you might. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I've heard of people and I've known of people who didn't even know they got abused until they were older and could understand what even happened to them. Listen, right? listen, I was one of those um, people. And like, so, yeah. So, well, and so, like, the reason what? I say that is because when you leave the house, when you leave the house and you start surrounding yourself with all of these stranger adults. Right. Mm -hmm. um, there's people who, you know, I mean, you know, take advantage of kids. Uh, well, I understand that. I understand that. And so, I understand that. Yeah. But yeah. all you need, all you need, then in that case, People until in, yeah. until they're like a little bit older, all you need is that Sonic says clip, where he says, "If you're touched by someone that you don't like, you just have to tell somebody about." It. That's all. You just play that clip. Just, yeah, I mean that's yeah. kind of what I'm describing. You know, until <laughs> you're, you're touches older, you in a way you don't like. That's no good. No good. No, I yeah, understand. I mean, yeah. at least yeah, yeah, me, yeah, I like when I was in elementary school, like I had sex ed in elementary school, and that's basically what I learned. It was like mm. you know the basic, like human anatomy, basically. Yeah. Um, and uh, like where babies come from, like yep. oh, it this was, is what pregnancy is. You know? but for, I had for me, something I similar like that, but I didn't make the dots until I was older. Yeah. I think I've just might have been a very dumb kid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. I had that. In and, I, and, I, and I went to elementary school in a southern <gasps> state, by the way. So, I mean, wasn't exactly the well, actually, know, I didn't go to. It, it wasn't fucking the People's Republic of fucking California or anything like that. I mean, it was, it was just. <laughs> well, like Econovoy. Econovoy, econ econ what, what grade were you when you, when you had that first lesson? Because for me, it was grade five. So, I think I was already 10 at that point. No, for me, it was. Uh, it was it was a long time ago. Um, I mean, it was first or second grade. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it was well, very maybe, early. Maybe the situation <laughs> is we both we both value when we had it because we were we we believe looking back that we were the proper age to have it when we did. I guess. I mean, I think you're. I think you. I think. I don't know. I just think that in hindsight, like you know, I was. When was I? I was. Uh, it was about. 18 or 19 years ago when I was six or seven, right? So not, you you know, I'm not an old yourself? man or anything like that. Um, yeah, I guess so. And the point is just to say that, um, you know, I don't, I think most people, if they were to learn basic human anatomy and like what pregnancy is when they were six or seven and they grow up to be 18 or 19, I just, I don't think most people would look back on that and be like, man, that was fucking crazy that I learned that. <laughs> like, that's insane. Yeah. Like, it, I don't, you know what I mean? Like, if, I don't know. If Kids you're not... If you're not you talking know. about uh, like your private like, parts and don't let you shouldn't let anybody touch it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, if, if you're not I mean, talking about the go. pleasure <laughs> of it or like the social implications or like showing some degenerate shit, yeah, yeah, you're probably pretty much right. I think. Yeah, I mean that's all. That's all that. I don't know. As far as I'm, I mean, maybe people can link examples, but like, as far as I'm aware, like the type of sex ed that is taught to elementary school kids is pretty much just that. Like, I don't okay, think so elementary school kids learn. Here, here's... Anything much more in depth than that. <laughs> so whenever I talk to you, I always go on crazy tangents. So let's here, okay, just real quickly. The this is this is a point that I've made on multiple videos now, and also with you, Lilith, before. But the problem yes. with right. with with um the whole libs of TikTok grooming thing is that libs of TikTok okay. can actually sometimes present people who are doing bad things, and they have. But the issue is is, is when you shine a spotlight on say the worst of humanity your audience assumes that that's normal and not the exception. If that makes it. Oh, you, you, you yeah. Yourself. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's similar to when people post, like when people post videos of like, look at this unionized worker being lazy and horrible. Can you believe it? And it's mm -hmm. like, yeah, I mean, I, I agree that some, some workers are bad and some of those workers happen to be represented by a union, mm -hmm. but that doesn't make, that doesn't mean that we just shouldn't have unions. Right. Like yeah, yeah. It's, it's racial uh, minority committing a crime. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like there's some some give and take with a lot yeah. of these. I mean, you know, it's you you can't uh you know, you can't reasonably it's like you can't reasonably expect every teacher to be perfect and you can't expect every parent to be perfect either. I, a lot of times when people say that, you know, this is between a parent and their child, it's like I, you know, I, I do actually agree to some extent, right? Um I mm -hmm. just think that number one 
there is a role for public education to have some sort of, I mean, to give kids a basic social education, right? Which might include sex ed or like manners, right? We teach kids the golden rule and stuff like that. You might argue that's between the parent and the child, but we teach kids that in school. We should um, kids teach kids how to yeah. do taxes. Yes, we should. And pay yeah. bills. Even though it's in theft. The first grade. Even though it's theft. I think the average first grader could handle yes. doing their taxes. Just so, just so I mean, kids can learn how just how thefty yeah. it is. Yeah, our, our schools should teach kids to shoot the tax man when he shows up <laughs> to prevent uh, to prevent Jesus. theft to prevent <gasps> the theft. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, but yeah, I'm thinking so, so, more so, uh, about yeah. Go on, go on, Deb. <laughs> it, for, for example, I saw like um, here's a book that they were showing to people who were I think four or five years old, and it had like this cartoonish drawing of a guy and girl having sex underneath the covers and describing that like the penis gets very hard and sp- and sprays sprays semen inside inside the the woman and i'm like that's probably a bit much for a 5 year old okay maybe you can save that one for a little yeah. bit later but just because there's this one book in this one school and you can point to that school and say hey you're doing something wrong doesn't mean that every school does it doesn't yeah. mean that every teacher does it you well, know? is it a, also also one thing is like is it a public school Right. It was so a lot school, of the yeah. examples that people, it was public school. It's all, yeah. A lot of the examples people point to are from private schools, right? So I don't mm-hmm. know about this school that you're talking about, but like, yeah, I mean, in in scenarios where you're graphically depicting sex to kids, I mean, I, I think that this is an area where most Democrats would say, yeah, I mean, we that's no, like that's not that's weird, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. But uh, Again, I mean, like like what you said, Dev. I just, I, you know, to me, that's not a reason to that. That's a reason to, like, investigate that specific example. But that's not a reason to just, oh yeah, just get rid of sex ed until they're twelve or thirteen or whatever, yep. like, um, whatever the rule would be, or like abstinence only or something. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. no, I completely agree. Yeah, Th- that's always been been my my problem with libs of TikTok is even when they're correct, they're they're making it seem like these exceptional examples are more common than they actually are. And that's, that can be a problem, but that's yeah, a problem that's with like everything to do on both sides. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can, you can, you know, you can look at, for instance, when I, you know, I didn't tweet about it much, but like when, um, when the Tennessee, uh, Republicans, uh, they proposed, oh fuck, what was it? It was some proposal regarding, uh, the ability to marry people under the age of 18, like to marry children, basically, uh, with the parents' permission. Was it and like 16 or was it like five? Like, what are we talking about here? I want to say it was 14. I didn't look into the okay. specific example because my reaction to that was basically like, yeah, like maybe Tennessee Republicans that proposed this are crazy, right? But I just don't, <laughs> like, I don't know if it's fair to criticize like Kevin McCarthy because a state, like a state representative for like the Tennessee house proposed something. Right. And I think similarly, we end up, you know, looking at individual school district policy and judging, you know, the entire democratic national fucking platform, which doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. Um, it, it just like, Hey, criticize that school district, criticize that member of the Tennessee house who proposed it. Um, but you know, if it's not a broad trend, it's not a broad trend, right? And yeah, you, know, yeah. you have to be know fair on both sides. Anyway, the left are pedos. We have to accept that before we move on to the That's next true. topic. There you go. I mean, we can't, <laughs> um, you know. Yeah, for all the people calling me a groomer, you realize Dev just agreed with everything I said, right? I mean, yeah. geez, you, know, guy, you guys are, <laughs> it's... You, know, you, guys are watch, you guys are subscribed to a groomer. You're not subscribed to me, apparently. <laughs> You're the ones watching a groomer like Dev, for God's sake, guys. Come well, on. It, yeah, see, here's the thing. I think the primary reason that my audience is more right-leaning than me is because I'm very pro-free speech to the point that I don't censor them. So they're like, we'll just run wild. And it's <laughs> okay. like, all right, you have fun with that. Again. You. <laughs> any anything uh you know any anything uh below TOS you know that's that goes pretty much yeah pretty much okay so that makes sense we have here I, we, we we're gonna read the super chats later okay guys because this so so the Isaac Clark guy who is an ANCAP who has watched me for years and he really likes my stuff even though I'm very much not an ANCAP um he's been like Dev you and Akana boy never understand. What it means to be a true libertarian. Same with you, Lilith, sometimes. So we're going to yeah. watch this video that was sent to us called The Intro to Anarcho-Capitalism. I don't yeah, know what... The ourselves. intro. Yeah. And actually, here's the I thing. Only... 
Um, the last time yeah. that we got together at Econoboy, we were supposed to talk about, you know, Austrian economics, free marketeer economics. I wanted to get some of your takes on it. We didn't have much time for it. Maybe you'll be able to critique some of this stuff in a way that we couldn't because I, I only took intro yeah. to econ in, in university. So that's all you need. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, also, I don't remember any of it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember that's anything from my first year of university. People. I don't remember shit. <laughs> All right, I only agree to watch this video if we do it on one and a half speed. Oh, because it's so long? I used to watch it on regular speed. All right, let's see. Can I change? Well, it's long and also probably boring. <laughs> oh, really? Do you think so? I mean, do you it's know a who video this, who about this is? So. Do you find them to be like a boring philosophy? I just don't. Um, I don't. I don't. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just say yeah. <laughs> I'll just say yeah. I'm trying to. <laughs> I was trying to come out. I was trying to come up with something, but yeah. I mean, most most videos explaining like schools of thought or philosophy are boring. To be fair, like mo you know, most people like like you know, it's not it's not very interesting for most people. You know. No, fair so. enough. Fair enough. You know, I will say, having read some some of good old Hans Hermann Hop or Hoppe or whatever however you pronounce his name, I, he he's an end cap, and he has one good idea that I actually like. And so here, here's the only interesting part about the philosophy that I found so far. And it's the idea that even if we lived in a stateless, moneyless, classless society where all where there was no more scarcity of anything. And so everything was kind of interchangeable because you didn't have like, why, what does it bother? What, what does it matter if you have if you ha, like you don't have to own anything because everything it's, there's infinite amounts of everything. So there's no 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 purpose for ownership anymore. He said that even in that society, you would still necessarily have to have some what he called a theory of exclusivity because your time is finite and your body is finite and you can still trade your time and body for things. So there still has to be some conception of property. And I liked how he laid that out. That made a lot of sense to me. So like, so it, it was kind of a, a debunking of the communist utopia as if you need any more debunkings of it, but it, it was a good idea to me. And that's, yeah. that's the only thing that I like out of the hand caps that I've read so far. Yeah. I think this will come up here because, um, yeah, I mean, at least ANCAPs would agree that you have to work, right, in yes. our society. Whereas a lot of anarchist leftists or anarchist communists would say, like, we're gonna have to our replicate goal... her from Star Trek. Yeah, magically. I mean, yeah, yeah. And to be fair, like, we can imagine societies like that. Like, I've had this conversation, I think, a couple times now with socialists, where it's like, you know, well, Econoboy, what happens when AI can literally do all human labor? Like, what then? And it's like, okay, well, at that point, um, we would we would need to do basically completely massive redistribution because like you know the alternative of having a 100 percent unemployment rate <laughs> is probably not very sustainable and in a world where ai can do everything we probably don't need to work like i mean yeah sure at that point like you know government distribution of basically you know giving everyone a basic income basically makes a lot of sense um but um you, you know we don't we, we don't live in that world yeah exactly mm -hmm. so i mean it's it's uh to me it's not as interesting a, a conversation Okay, so I'm going to bring the video in. Will this will this button work? All right, let's do it. This button works. Okay. This I said, is on is it W2G. It, on it is. Hey, there's one point. Maybe I have to, like, hold on. I'm going to play it just a little bit. Really? Yeah, it works for me. Okay. Wait, reason? Oh, they kill you. Wait, how did you get here? Well, I was in my space oh, station, God. I was in my lab, particle accelerator switched on, and a rift in space and time opened up, and long story short, I'm here. Oh, I think that might have been me. Sorry, that happens sometimes when I portal somewhere. They hate me at CERN. Hey, no problem, so what are you up to? Well, I was trying to think of something to do, so out of boredom, I decided to... I can see why you wanted it. I can see why you wanted it. So where exactly are we going? If my calculations are correct, when we reach the bottom of this void, it should take us straight to the gayest person that has ever existed in any realm of existence. Oh, to Milo Yiannopoulos or Ted Haggard? We're about to find out. But um, bum Oh, this is Dapperton's house. That's so cool, right? Nah, I come in here all the time. I break in every week or so and stock up on stuff. Hey, it's not like there's a 7-Eleven in deep it. space. Doesn't he notice? Ah, uh, he just thinks it's mice. Okay, hold on. Let me just adjust the portal. Ah, fucking mice again. What the fuck? Oh, that thing gives me a hangover. Oh, Listen, hey guys, I'm banning up? the guy wait, who wait, wanted wait, me to watch this. To we're, we're gonna get to the Ooh, point I'll eventually. Get the camera. Wait, wait, Reason, well. can you portal me back to my space station? I have taqueritos in the microwave. Sure. Whoa, we're, we're getting some lore, apparently. Introduction to anarcho-capitalism. Ba-da-ba.
Hello, okay. boys, girls, and those who sexually identify as a Target shopping cart. I'm Mr. Dapperton. And I am Reason. And I'm Lord Gillian, and this is an introduction to anarcho-capitalism. Oh, boy. Very original joke there. Now, if you've never heard of that term oh. before, let me elaborate. Anarcho-capitalism is an economic system in which the government does not exist and companies are regulated by the free market while individuals abide by natural law in the form of the non-aggression principle. Aggression refers to initiating force or fraud against true. someone. Or otherwise uh, you, you can pause whenever you want. If, hold on, hold on. State is a group of people who have the perceived Wait. legitimacy. <laughs> you can pause whenever you want if you want to, like, comment on <laughs> like any of it. The first thing they say is, you're like, it's just funny that the fucking, like, the guy, you know, he gives us this video is like, you guys don't understand anarcho-capitalism. And the mm. first fucking thing this video says is, Anarcho-capitalism is when the government doesn't exist. It's like, that's not true. Like, anarcho-capitalism is when the state doesn't exist. And the difference is that if people want to come together voluntarily and form a government, that's okay. It's voluntary, though, right? Like, that's yeah. that's like, like that's the difference. You can opt out. Right? The, fe the feds um, won't chase you for taxes. You can opt out of the state if yeah, you want to, yeah. But you can but you can still have government. <laughs> and, like, gov you can have single-payer health care in an anar anarchist-capitalist society, right? It's just you have to volunteer to participate in that system. Now, there's problems with that, but, like... <laughs> It's just, I don't know. I just hate it because a lot of Marxists and anarchists, like, they'll DM me and you. I'm sure this happens like, everyone that talks politics or economics where it's, like, MMT, too. It's, like, you just don't understand this. And every fucking single time, I either talk directly <laughs> to those people or I, you know, talk back and forth through chat. It's, like, I, you've only reaffirmed that I actually know exactly, <laughs> like, what the main <laughs> part of this. Like, I don't understand why you're saying these things. Fuck. Anyway, all right. and also, I, play it again. well, just really quickly regarding the non-aggression principle, like I think that's actually a fine way to live your life. If you, if you know, you don't attack someone unless you're attacked first. Fine, fair enough. But like, if you expect an entire society to run on that, with you know millions of people, like you, you have to be out of your mind. There has to be some kind of coercive measure to stop people who don't give a shit and will just run roughshod over you. Yes, there yeah. has to be some enforcement of property. I think. Yeah. Wow. Lola well, believes in government. Can't believe it. Yeah. I, I do. I, I, I am sympathetic towards the end caps, but I am. Um, cringe. I do think uh, <laughs> anarchy is fairly cringe for the most part. <laughs> yeah, Lilith. You, you were... I think the state's very cringe. You... I think the state's an evil, but it's a, for now, a necessary one. Yeah, a necessary evil. I think it's a necessary evil as well in a lot of ways. Um, but yeah, Lilith, you've you've been doing a slow transition from like libertarian to just libtard, so. I've I've been transitioning from, like right libertarian to just libertarian. Yeah. If if it makes any sense. No, it does. Like no, I'm, I, I, yeah. I'm not I'm I'm way less concerned with like, with like um. Specifically following one. Group of logic or another. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. Whereas um. Or is it more in favor of taking things on a more individual cases? Mm. That doesn't mean I'm in. That doesn't mean I'm like for redistribution. Like, for example, like, like no private property or whatever. Right. Yeah. Like you mean like 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 a pure collectivized society. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. think that's fairly cringe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's continue. Let's see what else they have to say. Let's go. Let's do it. Fucking. I'm sorry, Econo boy. Let's keep going, boys. To initiate force over a certain geographical area. Since we don't believe that it's right for anyone to commit acts of aggression and government is just a bunch of people, then we don't believe the government gets to commit acts of aggression either. Now, I know what you're thinking. Don't we already live in a capitalist society? Well, the answer is no. The society we live in today is called corporatism. You're probably wondering what the difference between corporatism and capitalism is. Well, Let's in a capitalist it. society, you get to vote with your dollars. If you don't like what a business is doing, then all you have to do is not support it. And when enough people stop supporting that business, it will go bankrupt. That's called the free market regulating itself. But in a corporatist society, the state decides in part what companies deserve our business. Hold on a second, though. Okay, let's say we have... I'll, I'll give, I'll give the, the, the surface level objection to this. And I hope they get to talking about this. Let's just give it really quickly. All right. You have your free market, okay? You have two competing factories. Factory one decides to cut costs and dump a bunch of sewage into the river. And downstream, a town dies of poisoning. Okay, the free market reacts, and people stop buying their goods from factory one, and they all switch over to factory two, and then factory one goes out of business. Okay, the free market has worked, but the town, of, the, 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 the people in the town still died. You, you, you didn't solve that problem. Yeah, it's not very proactive. Yeah. Like, I think there's things that we can do before just letting people die before a market reacts. 
I think that's a, a fair yeah. criticism of this. <laughs> I don't disagree. Like, I think there should be like, even in in um, in a total free market, there should be like you can't put poison in baby formula. Yeah. I I don't think so. A body maybe. I don't know if if it has to be the state, but like if a if a body if a regulatory body came and said, "Hey, I know you like you like um, razor blades a lot, uh, but you cannot include rusty ones in people's products has because to be... people might get people might get <laughs> diseases and die." <laughs> has to be only the sharpest ones can go in. No, I, I know just, what you mean. I know just, what you mean. I'm just joking. I'm joking. I know what you mean. Example, but yeah, still, okay. Yes, only right. the sharpest. All right, let's, let's roll. Regulation and subsidy. Pick winners and losers and dictate the terms of doing business. Bigger corporations buy power from the government through lobbying and kickbacks to have new regulations put in place that will choke the competition, or as economists call it, regulatory capture, while government uses taxes and central banking to prevent the market regulating itself. When a business is going bankrupt and government bails it out, that is corporatism. That's what America is becoming more and more of, a corporatist monstrosity with government exercising more and more control. Picking... My points about corporatism isn't wrong, though. We do live in a, you think so? a very anti-capitalist and very corporatist society. I mean, maybe in some ways. Like, I know Obama bailing out too big to fail. That kind of got under everyone's skin back in the day. I can see the, the argument. But, I mean, I think if that were, were truly the case in all instances... It's not only that. It's, it's the government picking winners and losers when it comes to industry. It comes... It's... It's them regulating things so as to prevent new competition. It's that type of stuff that's, that's a symptom of corporatism. It's anti-free market, if anything. I mean, does the American government do that all that often? They do it constantly. Yeah, like like uh, corn. Like uh, There's like huge, huge subsidies for that. Mm. That's why everything yeah. in America is, is uh, derived from corn in some way. I don't well, know. There's I'm, I'm, huge I'm, subsidies for agriculture in in general, but I, I don't think that that um. No, I'm just using like that subsidi- the corn thing as one example. Well, but broad-based it, subsidies it wouldn't necessarily pick like winners and losers, right? Because your like your whole market gets the subsidy, right? Is that the case in the states that everyone who who's even like a new person growing corn gets the subsidy as well? Well, it depends on the exact subsidies that Lilith might be referencing. I think that the way that um. I believe that the way that agricultural subsidies work in the United States is you basically get, um, you either get paid, uh, you'll basically get either part of your CapEx subsidized or the government will buy direct from you. Um, one of those two things. Uh, oh, okay. But, All right. I don't yeah. know. Lilith probably knows more than me. Um, I don't know anything about American farming, to be honest. But uh, the my objection to this point comes in the form, though, of... If it were the case that it was all just, if, if in every case it was big business and big government kind of shaking hands and making deals, it, it kind of seems like, like, why is it that pipeline projects are failing? Because big oil wants those, that shit to go, but it seems like the, 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 the electoral will is not there, you know? Like, I, I don't know if I'm saying this correctly. It's, it's something like oil pipelines are, are very electorally unpopular. And yet, I'm sure everyone with money wants them to happen. And nonetheless, pipeline projects are getting canceled. So, I think, yeah. like, I, I think, there, like, there's definitely some kickbacks. It obviously it happens somewhere. Like, there's there's some corrupt person somewhere doing something. But I think that electoralism still works, generally speaking, at least for the big stuff. About everything gets the backlash. True. And I'm I'm sure there's things that fall through the cracks. Yeah. A lot most things probably do. <laughs> let's let's keep going here winners and losers and making things more expensive for the consumer while forcing them to have fewer options so can we please stop pretending that america is some kind of bastion of perfect capitalism it isn't it's not even the closest in the world it's currently number 17 on the index of economic freedom tied with denmark the netherlands the uk canada australia and new zealand are all examples of countries that are more capitalist than the united states based in a free market economy like anarcho capitalism the best businesses will all, thrive while all the countries with a lot of government bankrupt. programs <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> and offer cheaper and easier rides and if the taxi companies couldn't compete they wouldn't have a government to go whining to like they do today that is the nature of competition in the free market for a few minutes i want you to look at the state as a business it has a monopoly on the use of force and you are forced to associate with it now government also what? provides oh, services oh, like health care wait, wait a second police you- 
L- look at the state like a business. And then the very next sentence, it has the monopoly on the use of force. That's why the state isn't a business. It's yeah, super business. I I, super business. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people make that argument where it's like, uh, I, I can't remember which anarchists made this argument to me, but they were making the argument like, um, well, you know, in economics, you learn that monopolies are bad for like competition, right? And well, the government is a monopoly of, you know, force, right? And so wouldn't it be better to decentralize that and break it up and let the market handle it? And it's like, well, no, I mean, because, y- you know, basic economics also doesn't tell you that markets are great for everything either. Right? So, I mean, there's <laughs> there's a little bit more... Uh, a little bit more nuanced than just like market concentration bad. Therefore, always break up market concentration. You know? Yeah. Um, I, I guess there's uh, like not it, necessarily the case. It seems like there's two values being pursued here, and one of them is competition, which leads to efficiency, it leads to, to to better products. The other one is is universal access to something that's important. But those two things they're necessarily at odds with each other. And in some arenas, one of them has to win. In some arenas, the other one has to win. And it seems like for certain things, like maybe, you know, access to a justice system, that has to be a bit more equal for a society to be stable. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, that was the argument that I made to uh, Fabian Liberty, who's like an anarchist on Twitch, which was that, um, well, in a scenario where someone is like trapped, like born into a commune that's really, really authoritarian and, and, and terrible, like his his solution was literally... Well, you know, after the after the girl's done getting abused and stuff like that, she can go on the internet and then search around <laughs> for a rights enforcement agency that's willing to extract her for a fee, um, and then you if know she has the money, that, right? If she has the fucking money, well, Jesus. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's like, well, I just don't, like, I don't know. I just, I don't know if you should. And his his thought was like, well, if she didn't have the money and they still charge her an exorbitant rate, she could just go to another rights enforcement agency and take the other rights enforcement oh, agency God. to court for you know not having a get an unconscionable contract and it's like well but wait but i thought the whole point was that you're volunteering and it's you know it's not coercive necessarily but if it is we can go to the court and get it annulled or whatever but at that point it's like god damn it just sounds like a broad you know a, a broadly funded police department it just sounds a lot more equitable in this situation right so i don't know i've yet to hear a good uh, response to that criticism mm. i don't know what i'd say to that either i'm it's my first time encountering the the idea, so I haven't really thought about it. Maybe I'll think about it. Maybe I'll become the ANCAP of your dreams one day. The ANCAP. Dev. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> you may agree that you want these services, but the state doesn't let you pick and choose. If you like food stamps, but not war, you still have to pay for both. And since the state doesn't let you take your money elsewhere, it is in fact stealing from you. Not to mention the fact that it's crowding out any private markets for these. Before government meddling in healthcare, for example, we had mutual aid societies that were voluntary, but worked out the way statists would like universal healthcare to work, only without all the problems we're seeing from it, because universal healthcare is a monopoly forced on people. Wait, and if wait, you're going to say that wait. there's no way the private sector could provide, say, police services, well, how would you... I, I'm, I'm, I'm losing my fucking mind here. Is that true? Were there actually these mutual oh. aid healthcare services in the past? Uh, well, obviously they existed, but the, 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 the question would be, like, to what quality and to what, you know, there were, to, okay, to what there were doctors quality. That, that communities could hire, and there was like a medical groups that uh, that did like a cheap medical stuff for any given town right. or community for a very cheap and I believe it was like that Wild was West like, stuff. Then I was no, I don't think it was Wild West. It was it was like early. It was like the early nineteen yeah. hundreds mm-hmm, yeah. up to. The question is just to, to what quality were those services provided and to what scale, right? So that's the big argument that, again, I haven't heard a great response to, which was that, I mean, it seemed like well, what introducing I've heard, the, the quality basic was welfare. fairly good and um, the price was very cheap. Well, for the time. Well, I'm though. sure it was cheap, yeah. obviously, back, yeah, back in the day. But yeah. um, I, my only point would just be that it seems like introducing some basic welfare into the system, like Social Security. Medicare, Medicaid, stuff like that resulted in real, like real terms differences in people's access to these resources or like access to a basic quality of life in the case of Social Security. Um, And if it was the case that, oh, well, back in the day, we had these mutualist, you know, this mutualist understanding and we all took care of each other. It's like, well, why did Social Security decrease elderly poverty then? It should have had no effect if that was the case, right? Um, Mm -hmm. If people were really just taking care of all of our grandparents already, right? Um, Why was it? 
why why is it real terms of difference in access to healthcare when you institute things like Medicare and Medicaid programs? Well, it's obviously because the free market just wasn't taking care of that. Well, you know, I use the example of homeless veterans. You know, the free market is free at any time to end veteran homelessness, but it doesn't. Right? <laughs> so, you know, I just. Uh, I don't know. To me, yeah. you, you need some. The, 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 the argument for welfare is scale. It's not like, to me, the more rational argument is scale. Less so, like, should we have any welfare at all? For me, mm-hmm. it, it, there's like, okay, I, I, I'm I'm not as well versed in economics as you are, Connor, but I, I think I can explain this clearly. Yeah, clearly, <laughs> there's 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 an idea that a free market functions if the people who are doing the buying have pretty good information about what they want and what products they're looking at. But the average person knows nothing about healthcare. They don't know what 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 uh, disease they might have. They don't know what the treatment is for it. They have to rely on the opinion of the doctor. And so there's no reason why, in a free market, a snake oil salesman couldn't show up with his cart and sell you a bunch of snake oil and be like, this will cure it. Of course it will. And then by the time you realize that, you know, six weeks later when you're dying of cancer, he's down the road with your money because because you don't it, the free market doesn't function in that case because you don't have enough knowledge to know what you're buying. Well, it's not just knowledge. There's also like like kind of like what you said in the, in the first place, which was that there's oftentimes there's a time delay in determining the quality of the product with regards to healthcare, Right. So if someone prescribes you something and it takes 10 weeks to take effect you have no idea for that amount of time if this person has screwed you over, if it's the best drug ever. You don't know what the side effects necessarily are. I mean, how many drugs are there like that? Like most of them, right? Most drugs are not like instant acting, right? Um, mm. And so uh, there's that time delay that exists that, like you said, you know, your, your doctor could be two states away by the time, uh, you know, by the time that happens. Now, the anarchist argument to this would just be that, well, you wouldn't get a prescription from like a new Un- totally unestablished doctor or whatever that is, but it's like okay, well, without a central authority to like certify doctors, you're 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 either in a scenario where you're transitively allowed to gatekeep medical care because you know you don't trust anybody who's a new doctor, um, or you have to go purely off of references, which you're going to have to trust someone to get that reference. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, you could still be screwed, right? Whereas at least you know if I go into a hospital today, I'm not. I'm not really worried that that doctor is trying actively to screw me over and is bad at their job. Like at the very least I know like, Hey, they went to medical school, they went to DO school, nursing school, whatever it is. Um, and you know, the, the, the pills they're prescribing me are, you know, within reason useful for this disease. Um, not that corruption in healthcare doesn't happen. Not that yeah, kickbacks yeah. aren't a real thing. To, to, but, to be fair here, Conavoy, there's the whole opiate crisis happening in the States right now that might throw a wrench into that idea. There's a bunch oh, yeah, of people I mean, who got, got prescribed opiates, and now they're like just fucked for life. Well, that was another example of a problem with the market, though. Like pro- the profit motive to prescribe this medicine caused that problem, right? And so. You know, I don't know if, you know, you know, a totally free market, uh, well, I say free market, but, you know, a totally free of regulation market uh, for, you know, opiates and opioids. I mean, imagine if we had no regulation or gatekeeping at all on the production and, uh, and consumption of opioids, right? Imagine how bad the opioid crisis would have been in that regard. That's the society that, you know, these guys are like, advocating for. I feel like if anything, there's a bit too much regulations in terms of opiates right now, though. How come? In terms of oh, like, man. in terms no, I in really terms of disagree. like patents, in terms of like oh patent patents, laws. patents, okay. Like uh, for example, insulin, insulins could have been made like a uh, yeah a hundred years ago, and and now only I think one company gets to make it. No, I mean insulin's an example where the patent actually expired. You know, insulin there's no closed patent on insulin. Um, the basic patent for insulin has been available for i want to say decades at this point um it's just that what's happening is that the free market arguably to some extent because of patent law um is investing a ton of money into producing new kinds of insulin that are faster acting um or don't you know they're 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 either faster acting or they require less uh like less pills per week or whatever it is or like you know whatever injections however you end up in taking your insulin um and people prefer those. Um, so okay. patents have their problems, but it's just, you know, the only point that to, to point that out is just to say that um, 
there are free market solutions that would make healthcare better and there's government solutions that would make healthcare better and they're not necessarily mutually exclusive but the society that the ancaps argue for which is completely and totally free market i mean again you know markets aren't necessarily free in the sense that you can have market failures right and absent that external force to correct failing markets um you know you just end up with markets free of regulation truly and that can be uh, quite detrimental to to uh, many people that uh, have to suffer those markets okay so you know, like, oh, go, go, go on no go, go on well go on. you still have to like oh gosh sorry no, I got your like, ass, Lilith. I, take, the, like... take the L. <laughs> this is not a debate. <laughs> actually, here's I'm the thing, because I, I'm not. <sighs> it's, it's okay, Lilith. It's okay. I, I, I'm actually. I'm also curious about this because I don't know much about this. So I'm, I'm, this is this is less me challenging you, and I'm, I'm coming for your scalp. I actually just want to know some some things about this. Um, I hear a lot about how it is government regulation in the United States that, for example, prevents. Americans from buying drugs from Canada where they're cheaper, for example, or how, how it can be patents. And then as soon as it, 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 you have patents on certain drugs that drive the price up and now suddenly people are paying out the ass for drugs that are quite cheap here in Canada. So so that seems like it is a problem with regulation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're like, you know, I talked to if anyone, I'm um, sure there's people in your chat that are familiar with Larry Sharp, who's a uh, pretty well-known national libertarian figure. I'm sure Lilith is familiar. Um, and he's currently running for governor in New York. And I actually had a debate slash discussion with him uh, in the uh, right as he announced actually his, his, his governor's campaign, which was a great experience. And um, what we came to an agreement on was that there are some free market solutions that would um, make healthcare better. So for instance, at least in America, um, like you said, you know, allowing Americans to import drugs from abroad probably makes a lot of sense with many, many different countries. Like we probably, you know, we probably uh, would agree that like the EU and the UK and Canada are producing, you know, quality drugs. Like I don't think there's any huge chicanery going on with their drug production process in those countries. So mm -hmm. allowing us to import from them makes a lot of sense. Or like, for instance, the biggest example that nobody really agrees with right like conservatives liberals it just seems like the ama gets involved is um the fact that there's literally uh a cap on the amount of i believe it's nurses certificates and residencies that you can give out every year so there's really? literally a cap on the number is of the united states trained medical yeah in the united states there, there's oh. literally a cap on how many people we can certify as trained medical professionals. <laughs> what, you know, what's the purpose? Uh, that was probably a point I was going to bring up later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's, that, the, yeah. That, what, what, what's the point of that, guys? Like, what the hell? Well, the point of that it's is that the American, oh, okay. the American Medical Association has lobbied Congress to say that, you know, on one hand, um, oh, you know, you can't just give a medical degree to anyone. It's like, well, no, but anyone who's earned it, number one, <laughs> is, is where you would give them to. And then number two, it's like, the truth is, it's uh, it's I called it healthcare in India. There are officially restricts the amount of doctors that can be in a country at any one time. It's super stupid. That because, sounds pretty like, stupid. Yeah. 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 Well, like in, I mean, Larry Larry Sharp pointed out that in New York State they had an even crazier restriction, which which was that, um, if you wanted to, uh, before COVID, because COVID caused them to change this policy because it was really a ridiculous policy. Before COVID in New York State, if you wanted to practice medicine as a doctor in New York State, they would only allow you to have a medical degree from New York, like state. So if you oh, studied Jesus. medical school in like, you know, if you went to the Mayo Clinic to study medicine in Minnesota um, and got your medical degree or whatever from, you know, there, they you were not allowed to practice medicine in New York State until COVID hit. Um, and I think similarly on a national scale, Another free market solution would be that um, similar to drugs, like, you know, if you were a doctor that was trained in Sweden, the UK, Canada, like many, probably a couple dozen countries, and you want to move to America, you shouldn't have to redo your residency. You know, if you if you were trained as a doctor in the UK and you've been a doctor for 20 years and then you move to America, you have to redo your residency, <laughs> which is like the most ridiculous fucking thing. This doctor who's 55 years old has to redo his residency. I mean, that's 
that's ridiculous. We, I assume that we trust the British that they are training their doctors properly. So, mm. you know, so that's another thing where it just it doesn't you know that the free market solutions exist for healthcare. It's just that you know the anarchists that would say that well the only solutions to the healthcare market are free market based. It's like well no, it's not true, right? You know, there's there's a middle ground here that's actually the most optimal uh, solution. That's usually how it is with a lot of things. Anyway, Econoval, you're you're becoming an end cat right before our eyes, man. You're morphing. True. <laughs> True. <laughs> no, I mean the truth is, you know, what I've told people uh, a lot is that um, Don't deregulate more. Deregulate more. Well, yeah, no, I mean, you know, mo- most, uh, you know, your basic economics is going to teach you that you know monopoly can be bad and also markets fail. Um, and sometimes, you know, sometimes government involvement is uh, is good for people. You know, mm-hmm. so. and sometimes it's not. And sometimes it is. It depends on the situation. Just it, depends. It, it's exactly. it's it, it's a very like is is the phrase neoclassical? Is a very neoclassical view of things. It depends. Um, I think that pretty much any economic school of thought is going to tell you it depends a lot. That's just kind of a favorite amongst. Uh, okay, fair enough. You know, most most I mean, economics people are going to tell you. I I, 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 w- I would say that there's an exception with socialists. They seem to be very dogmatic in the way that they kind of present their econ. But yeah, I think you're right. Otherwise, well, yeah, that's you know, true. That's the true. Austrians and like the Chicagoans and the the neoclassicals yeah, yeah. and the Keynesians. They're all kind of like that. Yeah, the schools, the economic schools of thought that are, like, actually taught. <laughs> Those are the <laughs> ones that, um... Because, yeah. you, I mean, you, you learn about, like, if you learn about Marxism and economics education, it's not in any of your basic courses. It's, yeah. You you probably took an elective on, like, Marxist economics, right? Yeah. To, um, to be fair... That's great. I mean, offer the elective, but it's it's not a mainstream school all, of thought. All of the Marxism I learned was in philosophy, not in economics, so... Yeah, that's definitely true. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, most... I, people argue whether or not Marx even was an economist. People will say like he wasn't an economist; he was a philosopher. And it's like I don't like whatever you know. I don't <laughs> really care about that. Um, um, but uh, you know, all your all your basic economics is going to be uh, not. It's you're not going to learn Marxism in your principles of macroeconomics course. Right. You right. Know, yeah. So. yeah. Let's, let's continue with this garbage. Let's go. Let's roll. Let's keep going. Fucking get through it. You you no. Know. <laughs> the state steals from you by Sorry. denying cheaper and better alternatives the market might create in its absence. The state steals from everyone. If you don't think they're stealing from you, then don't pay your taxes and see what happens. First, you'll receive notices from the state telling you to pay your taxes. If you continue not to pay, Here we go. they will take you and kidnap you and throw you in a cage, seize your property, and if you resist, they can kill you. Don't believe me? Look up a guy named Eric Garner. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds a lot like theft and extortion by a criminal mob to me. The government is just one big gangbang, and we have to pay protection money to them, or they can kidnap you, steal from you, hold you for ransom, and kill you if you resist. Think about any time you have to deal with bureaucrats, whether it's the DMV or the Social Security office or paying a ticket at the courthouse or whatever. How easy or convenient do they make it for you? You have to fill out form FS16-1982-J or whatever, instead of, say, simply going to a website like you do when you pay your credit card bill or do anything else in the market. With a free market, there's competition, so they have to make it easier for you because you can always leave. With government, you don't have a choice. By the way, have you ever... Okay, so so, so that, that sounds like he had a bad time at the DMV, and fair enough, I can sympathize. Um, I don't know what's like in the states, but in Canada, you can do things online like that, and it's pretty simple. Um, the broader point, though, is is taxation. Right, way, 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 way inefficient in places more than the DMV, though. Okay, f- fair enough, fair enough. Uh, the, the broader point, though, is the whole taxes is theft, and you're coercing me into interacting with with, with the government when I don't want to. That's like the philosophical point behind all of this, um, <laughs> and it seems like. The problem with this view isn't that they're wrong, in my opinion, because they're correct. They absolutely are correct. Taxation is theft. There's no way around that. And oh, no, man. it's true, Economy. you can't deny because they're no, taking money from you not. and you're not giving your consent. So it's the truth. So taxation is theft. You are, though. And, you are, though. And you also Tell do have to... Paper I sign. <laughs> you do have to, to... You do have to, like, interact with this entity that you didn't consent to interact with it's like fair enough okay so i can accept the taxation is theft argument but the issue God. is if you're living together in a society we live in a society if you're living together in a society with other people there's going to be some there has to be some kind of area where like the edges between you and other people meet and navigating that edge is going to be a little bit bumpy because that's what a negotiation is you have to give a little bit they gotta take a little bit and the, the 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 governmental process seems to smooth that over rather than getting into fucking fights with your neighbors constantly when like your neighbor's kid throws the ball over into your yard then you shoot him you know you can you, you can work these things out in, in a civilized manner and I I think it you know taxation is theft 
but it's a better it's better than the alternatives. Like any of the other any of the alternatives make up far worse society. I think so. You have to like you have to be willing to accept some level of coercion because there has to be something that keeps people bought into society, and it can't just be carrots. Sometimes it has to be sticks. I don't mean sticks the YouTuber. I mean like like a stick and a carrot. Yeah, yeah. I don't agree that taxation is theft. I think it's coercive, sure, but not all coercion is theft. Um, that's kind of the stance that I've developed at this point on taxation. Oh, okay. Um. And um, because I just, you know, I think you could, I think you have a stronger argument well, it's for coercion being with theft. the threat of taking away your rights and freedoms. Should you not comply, though? Well, but rights and it's, freedoms it's, it's, are—it's a little bit more than just like, oh, if you don't do this, like, uh, bad things will happen. Yeah. It's, it's 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 very bad things. Will bad happen. things will happen, and then and then yeah. your rights will be gone. Mm-hmm. Well, rights and freedoms are a construct of the state anyway, right? And so, you know, oh, arguably you could say that you're, well, arguably you could say that you're paying that money uh, partially for those protections anyway. Well, and now, hold on a second, now, we... Connor boy. I think that's completely okay. wrong. No, 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 oh, no. Okay, hold on. I, I, I get your point. I get your point. I, I know what you're going to say. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm trying to be rude or anything. It's just that I don't think that that rights and freedoms are constructs of the state. Yeah. <laughs> well, Complete the disagree. guarantee. Well, you could obviously yeah. argue that we have some moral, natural right, right? And I, I would mm-hmm. even agree to some extent with that, right? All that I'm saying is that the only way to guarantee your rights with some stability and validity is with the state, right? You you know, imagine living that, in yeah. a no, I, know, have anarchist... rights. I have rights regardless of the state. The state can only enforce that right or take it away. You could say that you have those rights morally, right? And you could make that argument, but if I'm bigger and stronger than you and we're living in caveman times, I'm stealing oh, well, your food. Nothing yeah, can but do what if that. I sharpen a stick and, <laughs> and I get lots of my friends to sharpen their sticks? <laughs> see, see, this That's is my what... point. You'd, you'd, yeah. you'd have to, you'd have the, the, you know, you, you need a force, uh, a, a body that is willing to, with force, protect and enforce those rights and mm-hmm. you could i mean to mm-hmm. me i'd call that a state a monopoly of violence right right so well, so, so that, you could I think start that... protecting that rights from the individual level though it doesn't have to require a state that's why you have guns like, right it, yeah yeah it could help yeah. but like yeah. uh it's not well, the yeah, obviously and you, end all. you can always defend yourself right all that i'm saying though is that when it comes to like the robust extension of those rights, right? In a, in a stable sort of collective sense. I mean, you you do need a state, right? I mean, unless you want to, you know, unless you want to constantly be digging trenches around your house and building fences and you know stockpiling <laughs> ammunition. I mean, you're gonna, you know, you're probably better off paying that tax to the state to, uh, you know, fund a police force and a military and stuff like that. I mean, yeah. what I was gonna say originally before I was I interrupted by Deb, before <laughs> that... I was. Interrupted by Dev and Lilith was that you could um, you I think sorry, you have sorry. a stronger argument that taxation is left in, a, in an authoritarian society where there's you don't have democratic input, um, but you know we obviously we we all live in uh, mm. uh, to be fair Lilith I don't know where you live but me at least Dev and I live in a democracy she, she so. lives in California yes it's a suffering well, there you go. but hey. <laughs> so here here here's the main reason I objected earlier Akana Boy and it's because you said that that rights. Um, it wasn't rights come from the state, but it was very similar to rights come from the state. What was it? What, what was your exact wording? Oh, you rights, right, rights are a construct of the state, right? So, yeah, see, so we can if, if that's the case. morally argue that we have some rights, but it's um, ultimately the rights that you're actually given in broader civil society are mm-hmm. given by the state. So if that's the case, then how can we reasonably say that, for example, China is taking away the rights of the Uyghurs because because China the, the the Chinese state has decided they don't have any rights to so at, at all and if if the state's the source of rights well then you can't you can't claim that the rights are being violated. Well, again, we can make reasonable moral arguments, right? All that I'm actually China to me proves my point in the sense that um, I think it was uh, uh, I think it was Anthony Scalia that once uh, talked about how the Soviet Constitution actually guaranteed many more fundamental rights than the U.S. Constitution. But the reality was is that uh, for the material rights, like the right to housing and health care, they didn't really have the infrastructure to guarantee those. And right, yeah. uh, with regards to the actual you know, sort of civic freedoms that they had, um, they were for show, right? They didn't really give those to people. Um, mm-hmm. And so we can certainly make a, a moral argument that the people of China are being oppressed and they should have more rights than they should. Um, 
And to me, China proves my point in the sense that, well, obviously, why aren't the people of China living free right now? Well, it's because of the government, right? The government's not allowing them to, right? Oh, sure. No, we, we, we agree on that. I think we agree on the fact of the matter. It's just that I, the, the problem that I have with seeing the, the state as, as the legitimate source of rights rather than, say, our common humanity is that if the state's the source, then the state can say, well, you don't have them, then you can't complain, you know? You can't say that their rights are being violated. That, that's a phrase that doesn't make sense if, if the Chinese state is the source of their rights. But it, it, it is yeah, a phrase, maybe, yeah, it is a phrase maybe, that makes maybe, sense. Maybe construct... If you, yeah, it, it, yeah, it, yeah, maybe the construct yeah, of the you know state I mean, doesn't yeah. make as much sense. Yeah, yeah, maybe the construct of the state doesn't make as much sense as like, um, you know, the best enforcer of rights is the state. To me, that would be maybe maybe that's a cleaner. Uh, yeah, and I agree with phrase. that actually completely. Um, that, that the best enforcer yeah, yeah. of rights I mean, is the, the state. Because yeah. cer certainly the best way to guarantee rights that, yeah. is a mm. is a state. So we we've we've reached a we've we've yet again reached a moderation in our. In Maybe our position, common ground. Uh, the common ground. Yeah. There we is, go. Is not originator of rights. It's a the enforcer. Of them. Of it can't. Well, it, but it it can be though the originator of rights, right? It can, uh, you know, the state well, can extend rights. Well, hold on. N now we're talking okay. about positive versus negative rights. That's a whole uh, fucking can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole. <laughs> it is the state that determines what is a right or not. Or, or maybe maybe, in, maybe in the state case. determines what's they're gonna what they're gonna enforce. You know. But but I, I do know I do generally yeah, agree what, with you. Yeah, what like, they're going to guarantee, basically. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so this this is this is kind of the the problem that I have with the whole stateless ideas because you can have a world without a government, and then you have various rights, and it's like, well, what are you going to do? You're going to are you, you going to turn your house into a fortress? Well, you can. You can set up turrets, and you can build a wall, and you can have a moat, and you can, you know, you can have you, you have lava pouring out the sides. You can sit you, you can sit there and guard guard your house with your gun all day long, and you have that right. You have the right to do so. But how productive are you? Like, what else are you doing with your life at that point? The answer is nothing. And if everyone's just pointing right. their guns at each other because someone might come and steal something from you, your society is going to collapse because no one's actually doing anything productive. So. There's, this, this is where I talk about like a I've I've talked about in in the past about high and low trust societies where you have a very poor society that still is prosperous at least relatively prosperous because they have high trust and so if you don't have to worry about you know your neighbor mugging you because there's at least some kind of social buy-in that's going to be part, and, and part of the social buy-in is going to be the carrot part of it's going to be the stick but you have the social buy-in such that you know that your neighbor's not going to steal your stuff when you go out of your house you can go to work and actually have a job and then build an economy so. That's that's why I think a state's important. You just have to keep it restrained. There we go. We're never gonna finish this video. No, we're not. But you know what? These are interesting conversations anyway. <laughs> I'm, I'm ha you know what? I'm no having fun. Yeah. yeah, I'm having fun. I'm having fun talking to you two. You're both my friend, and that's the most important part. Yay. Let's keep going, I guess. Keep, keep it going. going. Let's do it. Keep it going. Notice that when you do, that there's no good place to park because all the good spaces are reserved for bureaucrats, judges, clerks, supervisors, or whatever? When was the last time you saw Walmart do that? Walmart tells their people to park in faraway spots and leave the prime spots for customers. Because if they don't, you might go to Target or somewhere else. But again, the courthouse or the DMV or social security office doesn't have to worry about that. That's why it's such a bear doing something simple like renewing your driver's license. You have to fill out a bunch of forms, take them to different places, go to a special place to take your picture, and wait for it to show up in the mail. If that were done by a free market company, Isn't that you can do that online or with a smartphone app. In the Just States? Just log in, pay with your credit card, take your picture, and then they'll give you a tracking number so you know when to expect it. Um, if Amazon were in charge of it, that's how it would yeah. happen. Because they have to worry about competition, but your state bureaucrats don't. Right. Now you may be wondering how anarcho-capitalism will work without government enforcing laws. Well, it's quite simple actually. Libertarians base their ideals off a philosophical understanding derived from first principles called the non-aggression principle. The non-aggression principle, or NAP, in the simplest terms, states that the initiation of force is not logically justified, and in doing so, those who are having force initiated against them... I think we went over this earlier. I want to see what they do with it. ...correct for this act of aggression. Rights exist in a negative context, as they are passive and require no initiation of force to protect, and can only be taken away from an individual through an initiation of force. You may have heard this referred to as natural law, but some people complain that there isn't a law the way there is a law of gravity. These people are missing the point. The point of natural law is that it isn't being imposed arbitrarily by other human beings. There is actually a logical basis for it. You can't just make up whatever you want. A lot of times, people will come back with some example or other and want to know how you can determine who is in the wrong using the nap. They do come up with some cases that are difficult, but there are also cases <laughs> that would be difficult in any system. <laughs> Sorry, just, sounds just because you come up with a scenario where it's difficult to tell who it was that initiated the force doesn't mean that whoever did so wasn't in the wrong. Problems of investigation are not problems of principle. The map is there so that we can determine our rights deontologically, and the whole point of a system of deontological ethics is that arguments for violating them are never as reliable uh, as they first appear. So then what specifically hold, are human rights hold under on. law? Hold, I'm about to fucking lose my fucking... Okay. Can you just go back a little bit? How, how do you go back on, on this shit? 
explaining very basic concept just there. You no, know, I know, I, I get it, I get it. Like, f first of all, I hate whenever people bring up the deontological versus consequentialist thing if it's not necessary, but just, just, hold on, hold on. ...is into wrong. Problems of investigation are not problems of principle. The map is there so that we can determine our rights deontologically, and the whole point of a system of deontological ethics is that arguments for violating them are never as reliable as they first appear. That is a phrase that he took from somewhere, and I can't pinpoint it. That's not his. The whole point of a deontological system of ethics is that arguments for violating it are never as strong as they first appear. That makes sense on paper, but you get Christians who have sex outside of marriage all the time. Like, I don't think it works like, like that in reality. But I can't, I can't pin where, where you got that from. I've heard that before. Fuck. Ah, it's going to bother me for a while. Yeah. I think, it's from, I think it's from some writer or something. I can't, I can't fucking... Okay. Wait, so people are asking for the subtitles. How do you turn the subtitles on? Is there a way to do it? No! Um, Did I just ruin something? On this? I don't know how you turn subtitles on on this. I don't think you can on this. That's a shame. Sorry, guys. All right, let's keep going. Wait. Oh, no. Okay, no, we're fine. No! No! no. Just because you come up with a scenario where it's difficult to tell okay. who it was okay. that initiated okay. the force doesn't mean that whoever did so wasn't in the wrong. Problems of investigation are not problems of principle. The map is there so that we can determine our rights deontologically, and the whole point of a system of deontological ethics is that arguments for violating them are never as reliable as they first appear. So then what specifically are human rights under natural law? It all begins with self-ownership. You own yourself. You own your time. You own the thoughts in your head, your body, and anything it might do or have done to it, and the fruits of any labor it produces. To deny self-ownership would mean that someone else could legitimately claim this power over you, making you their slave. All rights are derived from self-ownership. Okay. As John okay Locke described them, they are life, liberty, and property. These are natural human rights because they require no initiation of force to be defended and exist in a negative context, meaning that they impart no obligation on anyone else. Anything that does isn't a right at all, but a privilege. Your right to life is the right to your future. Someone who kills you is robbing you of your future and everything you might have done with it. Your right to liberty is the right to your present. Everything you can do in the here and now. Anyone who puts you in chains and enslaves you is robbing you of your present. And your right to your property is the right to your past and everything you've done in the past to accumulate all the possessions you have. Anyone who steals from you is robbing you a part of your past. Life, liberty, and property. The right to your past, present, and future. Anyone that would deny you any of these things is denying you your right to self-ownership. Notice that what isn't included is something that's laughably called intellectual property. Actually, it wasn't called that in the olden days. It was actually called censorship until people realized that censorship was a bad thing because freedom of speech is an inalienable human right, and infringing on it is an infringement of liberty. So they had to rename it in terms of property to try and cover up for the fact that it is censorship. But if you hear an idea from someone or read something they wrote or listen to some music they performed, those things are now in your head and they become your ideas too. You have a right to express those ideas, either verbatim um, if you like them the way they are or derivative work if you'd like to improve on them. If you don't accept them. Okay, so... This vid has been muted this entire time. Yeah, they're saying that. They're just, they're just fucking trolling me. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah, it's the chat. They're trolling me. Okay, so, so I mean, I, I understand the whole life, liberty, property thing. I, I broadly agree with that stuff because, because the you know, I'm also I'm also a classical liberal in that sense, so I get it. Um, I don't I don't go where these guys go with it, but I, I, I at least agree with those starting principles. Um, however, I don't have much of, a, of an opinion one way or another on the intellectual property conversation. Is that a big deal in um, among ANCAPs, intellectual property? Like, is that a thing? Uh, some yeah. ANCAPs believe believe in intellectual property as an extension of property, but like most simply thinks there shouldn't be a limit on uh, thoughts and um, putting those thoughts down on paper and claiming I own them. Yeah. Or like, well, I think more so just like altering an original work um, and then marketing it. Like most, I don't know, most anarchist capitalists that I've spoken to basically don't believe in the concept of intellectual property. So like if you were to develop a drug, there's like, no IP protections associated with that drug. If you were to write a book, there's no IP protections associated with that book in an anarchist society. That that seems like it would it would destroy all creative endeavors. Yeah. Be really dumb and stupid. Yeah. Especially in a world where you can it just be, like it? copy everything on the internet. I th definitely think <laughs> copyrights, current copyright right laws should be way way less restrictive though. Um. I mean, yeah, maybe but again, I mean, it's, you know, the, it's right now the copyright laws are, are a product of Walt Disney Company and, <laughs> and Disney these, reaching from the grave. All these big lobbyists. Yeah, but that, I mean, like, that, hey, that's a, that's another example where, uh, you know, we can agree that, uh, 
you know, maybe the, the those laws should be liberalized to some extent, but you know, the argument that uh, you know, they just shouldn't exist at all <laughs> seems pretty destructive. Yeah, it should I... be deregulated. Oh, entirely? No more copyright law? Is that where you are, Lilith? I said it should be deregulated, not the entire, maybe not not the whole thing. I mm. think some. No, I, I, I think understand. Having some yeah. intellectual property is okay, but like I, I do. Let's say feel... I invent. Let's say I invent a product that can um um. I'd say I invent a product, and then oh, I don't want anybody to just like be able to copy what I've made, mm -hmm. and be like, "Hey, I be this is product, but shinier," and then I get no, no money out of it. I <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I think I think when it comes to copyright law, like you, you see Disney D Disney having like huge extensions on their various works, and that seems kind of ridiculous in my opinion. You should be able to remix some of those old movies at this point, but I mean there should be some level of protection. Maybe maybe not quite as it, it, what is it, what is it now? Like when the person dies plus seventy years, it's probably a little bit much. That, that seems like it's a little bit much. Yeah, I actually uh, some of Disney's originals are coming up for copyright expiration. Like um, uh, Mickey Mouse, I think, is about to come into public dom domain, which are, is like their main, yeah, their main person. So, are, are they um, reing yet? Or? I mean, well, I mean, the truth is, it's it seems like whenever like a major, um, it seems like whenever a major work is about to come up into public domain, it seems like they just fucking rewrite the law and then extend the the date again. Yeah, um, I'm not a fan of that. But I don't know. I don't really. I don't know. This is supposed to happen in 24 with Mickey Mouse, so I don't. I don't really. Uh, I guess I don't expect that to happen anytime. I don't. I don't imagine this will be a legislative priority for the more than likely split Congress in twenty twenty four. So yeah, they're not we'll going. <laughs> Things are going crazy politically as it is. They're not going to give a shit about that. I don't think. Um. Okay. Let's let's continue then. This and you think intellectual property is a form of actual property? Then really, you need to answer one question: How can you enforce it without initiating force? Real property rights only require defensive force against those who would take the property away. But if you write a song and someone else is merely singing it, how could you stop them without committing aggression against them? Stop this and you think intellectual property is a form of actual property? Then really, you need to answer one question: How can you enforce it without initiating force? Real property rights only require defensive truth? force against those who would take the property away. But if you write a song and someone else is merely singing it, how could you stop them without committing aggression against them? Okay. Hold on a second. Is it actually the case? Well, what that... if you sing that? What if, what if you sing that same song, and you market it to millions of people, taking your their work and yeah. profiting off of it? You turn that song into a CD that you then sell. Yeah. The the, the argument and without that... credit. Mm -hmm. And so it's like I feel like there has yeah. to be a balance between that. Yeah, I don't I don't, I don't know if I, if I if I if I like this guy's opinion either. I, here's me take being a, a, a boring centrist again. That's what I'm known for, I guess. I look at me disagreeing with the ANCAPs. So let's answer some of the common here. arguments that statists have <laughs> against anarcho-capitalism. But first, let's define statism. Since anarcho-capitalism okay. is the consistent application of the non-aggression principle, a statist is someone who thinks that there is at least one issue somewhere where the initiation of force is justified. In other words, they think that force should be initiated if it's for something they agree with. Whoever would be initiating that force is a state, and generally they're given authority to do so over a certain geographical area. <laughs> and statists will generally defend it on the basis of good intentions, focusing on that instead of the actual uh. results of the policy they're promoting. But intentions don't matter, only actions and consequences. One of the common arguments that, that, we get that's... from statists is, well, who will build the roads if there isn't a government? Wait, hold on. Okay. Oh my god, I, I, I'm having a fucking seizure! Like... Are you okay, Dove? I, I feel like... Every like five words, I have a new objection. I'm just like, what? But uh. power through it, Dev. Econo boy. Yeah, I've I've seen on your channel you've debated a lot of like end caps. How do you do it? Well, um, you know. Well, honestly, most of the ANCAPs that I've debated have um, not made such, you know, simplistic arguments, right? <laughs> I mean, at least you know, the type of ANCAP that's like the rights, rights Enforcement Agency ANCAP, at least they can kick out of a lot of stuff, right? Where it's like, oh, you know, how do you, uh, how do you pave the roads? <clears throat> and like, 
they would just say, well, you know, you're, you're, uh, well, not your rights enforcement agency, but they would just say like, oh, well, your community would get together and do this or that and, you know, whatnot. But I guess maybe you could say that uh, this person wouldn't necessarily disagree with that, but I don't know. This, this seems like one of the more like, um, everyone should live in the woods by themselves kind of ANCAP. It's like, <laughs> so it's like, it's like homesteading ANCAPs, basically. The entire society is just homesteaders, something like that. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what it seems like. Maybe maybe there will be more uh, depth in the latter yeah, like, the, the latter half of the video. He, he, he said something like, like, consequences matter, and it's like, well, hold on. Didn't you just say that you were, that you were doing deontological ethics on this, which is the opposite of that? And then... He, oh God, I, I don't want to rewind it, but there were like, I was, I was like, I was having like a new question and it was like, it's a simple, obvious question every few seconds. I was just, uh, <sighs> you could slow down the video. Hey, one, are you putting them on? No, I want to get, I, 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 I want to get through it. I'm, I was keeping it. I, wanna, I, I mean, I can watch videos on three times speed, but cause I, I, I got that giga brain going on, but we're doing 1.5. Let's go thing about this is it doesn't take consumer needs into mind along with that the needs of businesses to make it simple if there were two supermarkets and one had a road to it and the other did not which one would you go to i know i would rather use a road than risk busting up my vehicle the answer is right there competition is what makes this argument ridiculous as there's a profit incentive to have a road that lets you get to that business and if there are multiple businesses they can pull their funds to make a larger interconnected road that would allow consumers to reach their businesses and buy the products but let's think about something wait a minute what have government roads been but one massive <laughs> wait why would you fund a road for why would you fund a road for your 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 your, your competition. Why would it be interconnected? Why wouldn't everyone just have their own road? You wouldn't, Dev. You wouldn't. That's what? the thing. You, you, you mean you wouldn't be an ANCAP? You mean so you wouldn't have roads for your competition? Yeah, that's what I mean, though. So, like, there'd be just everyone would have a road. But then that means that there's, like, a billion roads. And that's... Uh... uh... But roads would still exist, Dev. That's that's the point you're trying to make. Yeah. But I don't know if I want to own 50 roads going to all the places that I have to go to. Or they just go down the one with, like, shops on it. All right. All right. We'll just, we'll just, we'll just, we'll just keep going. Let me know when anyone else other than me wants to bow out, okay? subsidy to the powered automobile industry. Without government roads, what would have happened? People wouldn't have just given up on the benefits of travel. They would build the roads themselves. Or if they didn't, then they might just plant crabgrass in the rights of way and get around on hovercraft. Or build people movers like Robert Heinlein wrote about. Just because government did things one way doesn't mean that's the only possible way of doing things or even the best way. <laughs> we don't need roads where we're going. Protect your property, which is pretty funny seeing as private property rights are passive and can only be deprived through the initiation of force. While the only thing that is required to maintain it is that no one attempts to initiate force to take it. Exactly. Property rights as a concept were created to protect people's property from the state. But just for an instant, let's humor this argument. How would private property be protected? Well, first of all, there's our natural right to keep and bear arms. We can do that to act in our own defense and defense of others like neighbors, co-workers, and family members. There's also the option of private security. Now, before you say that private security isn't as effective as state-provided police, I want you to see this. He looks and sounds like a cop. At least it's quiet today. And he and his fellow officers are certainly armed like cops, complete with canine. And when most people hear private security, what do they think? They, they think um, mall cop. No mall cops here. They are security officers with SEAL security. The Civic Association used to contract with the constable's office for a deputy to patrol the area. But now that it's gone with SEAL security, it has anywhere from three to four officers patrolling the streets at any given time and at half the cost. Also cut in half, the number of burglaries. And when a young mother in the neighborhood was recently stabbed multiple times in front of her children. Our guy just was on duty, routine patrol, comes around the corner, flagged down, sees the assault, draws his weapon, and breaks it up. It's great. I mean, I, I feel a lot better. Um, last month, my dad's car was broken into, and I've heard they've reduced the car theft here. By, by a significant amount. Increasing the neighborhood's sense of security. Now, as you can see, that not only are they more effective, but they cost one-eighth of that of a standard police officer, and they will be on site. Unlike police who take a standard of 15 minutes to arrive, unless you're in a poor or minority area, in which case it could take several hours, if ever. And either way, when they get there, they'll just outline your body in chalk. I don't know about you, but it seems to me that the private sector does a better job on average than that of the state. And this brings up another statist argument. Okay, so uh, actual, actual, actual question, Econoboy. Give me, give me your economics magic, your voodoo. Okay, what, yes. what is the, what is the, the argument against private police? Well, um, well, 
yeah, argu- there's kind of a lot of arguments, right? So, like, um, so with what they're describing, obviously they're talking about what appears to be like one, like one individual neighborhood, right? Um, it's, it's, I think so, it's an HOA or something. Um, yeah. Um, well, no, it sounded like the police department contracted with them. So again, I, I mean, it's not that. I mean, a public-private partnership with the police, to some degree, doesn't sound like the most unreasonable thing. If it's like, hey, you know, we um, we're taking a while to get this new recruit class in. We need more patrols in this neighborhood. We're gonna shoot this over to like a contract, you know, a contracted firm or something like that, um, and then like supplement our police force with that temporarily. Yeah, I mean, I can see something like that being reasonable enough, right? Um, but some of the sort of problems holistically with a private, you know, if everything was a private police force, right? Obviously, the question would be, well, um, can people really, you know, afford their own private security all the time? Um, that's kind of the big thing. Uh, right now, you might complain that, oh, the cop's going to take 15 minutes to get here or whatever, but, you know, they'll get they'll get there, right? And they're not going to ask you for a bill after they're done. Um, another thing is that I, I think... Some of the big issues with this with is like private security. Nerd. If you pay them a half, yeah, but you you still well, pay them though. You yeah, still pay but them, like, yeah, yeah, you, also, you, you pay, pay taxes too well, though. And, like, There's still taxes. Like, so I don't know if that's that's an argument necessarily because the money's going well, from you somewhere. Pay taxes, you know, yeah, but it's usually those taxes are progressive and it's a fully collectivized funding. Whereas you're under the scenario where you have to hire your own private sort of police firm or bodyguard, uh, you're sort of. Uh, well, you're you're bearing the full brunt of that yourself on a headcount basis, right? And that's certainly not quite as equitable as a progressively funded police force. So, hmm. But yeah. There's also problems with police force, as we see currently. Oh God, like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> like this most yeah, recent the, shooting. The... Like, didn't the police force wait an hour before going in? Well, it. Well, not yeah, even but, that. I mean, you see, like police abuse is... all the time. You know, no, of course you do. But the, the question is, you know, would you rather those police be accountable to, you know, a, a democratic structure or just the market, right? Just the corporation they might work for. Um, so that's kind of the question. I think that uh, for me, at least, I think that there is ways to. I feel like uh, uh, if, if a police, private police in this scenario, if they were there was like an active shooter and they weren't doing their jobs for an entire hour. That's a corporate structure would probably be incentivized to sack them rather than let them keep the jobs. Well, I don't know because if a corporate not, structure would incentivize. Hmm. Well, sure. On one hand, you could say that, but on the other hand, you could say that you know I've invested a lot of money in this employee, and I might not want them to you know take the risk of getting in a shootout with some criminal, right? You know, they might tend to stay farther back from that conflict otherwise, right? That might be more corporate policy, um, and so. It just and our kind people of can, can can take a look at your private security firm and be like, hey, so why why do we even hire them if they don't if they won't even put themselves at risk? Let's well, hire prob- some other private security firm. Well, yeah, but the issue is that we we are assuming that relative we're assuming that there's no geographic inequalities either, right? So like, um, one of the issues that I can see is kind of like a, uh, not like a well, yeah, I mean, kind of like a market for lemons problem, right? Where like. Um, you, you've got this dichotomy between like the most dangerous areas also often being the poorest. And so, you know, the, basically the security oh. firms, they want to offer more service to higher income neighborhoods because one, they're able to pay two, that's way less expensive to actually enforce the law. Um, and three, it's just less dangerous. Right. Um, and so now what you've is got the a market scenario where like problem? The, poor... the market for lemons problem is the, uh, well, it has to do basically what it's trying to point out is the argument um, of uh, market in market asymmetry in terms of information. So uh, okay. it has to do with used cars. Like that's the example. So the basically the the concept is that oh I thought you meant um, actual lemons absent, like like a fruit. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, so go, go, like, go on. <laughs> uh, absent any regulation or any sort of disclosure requirements, um, you're in the market for a used car, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and you're also like selling your used car. Let's say. Um, now, say that you're selling your used car, right? You're either going to charge a high price or a low price for it. Well, if it's a, if you know for a fact it's a quality car, you're going to charge a high price for it. Um, however, say that you're in the market for a used car to buy one. Well, you probably offer a middle ground between the high price and the low price because you don't know if this is a quality used car or not. If it's a high price, if it's a low price car and they're charging a high price for it, 
you're going to offer a middle ground because you don't want to be ripped off. Um, now, the problem with this is that it's always rational to basically never accept an offer for a car that people are willing to sell to you because the only people that would accept a middling offer between a high price and a low price used car are the people that are selling low priced cars because the people with quality cars are never going to accept a middling offer. And so eventually all the nice used cars are going to exit the market. The only, you know, basically the only product left is lemons. It's only crappy used cars that are left um, absent any sort okay. of disclosure or transparency requirements. And so similarly, when we think about private police, um, you know, the, again, the areas with the most crime tend to be the areas that are the poorest. Um, and so you've got the poorest people who need the police the most, who are the least able to pay for them. And so um, they're also the most expensive to the police. So they have to pay more than wealthy people would have to. Um, they'd be more expensive to find. There'd be less people probably offering the service to them. Um, and they'd have the least ability to pay. Uh, and so those, to me, are the big problems with, like, all of the police being private, I mean, that's the big problem, really. It's, uh, like you okay. said originally, it's an equity problem. Yeah. Well, I'm not for all the police being private either. I'm just pointing out how there's there's validity to criticizing the current police force that we have and oh, yeah. what they do. <laughs> there's some problems there for sure. I mean, at some point, I feel like maybe private security would do better for less if, if they had access well, yeah, to force, uh, the same force that again, the like police we, force does. It, you know, it sounds like we, you know, we can agree that there might be some scenarios where like augmenting, you know, augmenting police presence with not augmenting, but like supplementing police presence with some private contractors can make some sense. Um, it's just that ultimately that private contractor is still going to be accountable to the rules and regulations surrounding the police force and the police force broadly is, you know, democratically accountable, which, you know, to me, that's uh, for me, that's that's uh, really important. So. Aren't I even that accountable, though? I, uh, all, there's all these cops who do horrible shit, and then they get paid pensions and, like, golden parachutes. That does seem to be well, yeah, I, I, I get what you're saying. Again, it's, it's not a perfect system that we have today for a few reasons, but uh, my only argument would be that the accountability associated with a, um, well, the accountability associated with a private police force is either worse or non-existent because you just won't be offered the service or you won't be able to afford it. <laughs> and so that's kind of the, 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 the big, the big issue with a totally private police force, which, uh, you know, none of us agree with anyway. It's just the, the ANCAP uh, argument is basically using a, you know, apparently one specific neighborhood to justify <laughs> entirely dismantling a system. It's a pretty middle-class like, neighborhood too. Like it's, yeah. it's a suburb, but I, I, I guess I know what you mean because there's yeah. a lot of, there's been a lot of problems, um, or at least, at least a lot of light shined on problems regarding police discretion and people, you know, it, it seems like the case when, you know, a cop blows someone away who's innocent and then they go to court five years later when no one's paying attention anymore and the judge rules like, oh, well, you know, you, there, you know there, there, there's certain ways in the United States. I forget the name of the law, but basically it's the idea that police can very easily get off from using force, they get off of legal ramifications from using force. All they have to do is pre prove that they believe that they thought that it was necessary, which is kind of bullshit sometimes. Yeah. And so there's, there's like, there's that whole discussion, but you know, at least there's the possibility of, of through the democratic, to, through the democratic process, changing that law. If, if we need to change it, it, it seems like right, the ability to be proactive, like you mm -hmm. described earlier, right? Whereas in, in the scenario where you're screwed over by a private police officer, you know, you could, in theory, you could sue the company, you could sue the private police officer. But, you know, at the end of the day, that's a pretty tall order. And without a collective, you know, democratic apparatus to surround the police department, uh, you can probably imagine a lot of, uh, just like I said, a lot of inequities in that system. You know, I do not imagine that if, if the whole police force was private, why would there ever be a police force that patrolled the poorest, most crime-ridden areas? Because they're not going to be able to pay for it, and it's going to be the most expensive to patrol. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. why would that service ever be offered? Oh God! It's, I so mean, it's the same thing. Like, yeah. so someone in the chat just said you would have kneeled on him too, Dev. Jesus, <laughs> no! Yeah. I also wouldn't have given him the fentanyl. Fuck you! All right, let's keep let's keep going. Let's keep going. Let's do Keep it. One person in a lot of guns are hiring mercenaries and waging war and taking over everything. 
First of all, it's going to cost a lot of money to do so, so whoever tries will be at an economic disadvantage. You'd also need to hope against hope and hope finds God, out what you're up to, which argument. should be difficult as people <laughs> notice that you don't have much money and that gun sales are going up all of a sudden. And what happens if you do manage to get all those guns? You're going to be dealing with an armed populace. Each and every door you kick down is likely to have an armed... God, I'm sorry. Let's just... I'm going to pause. Just... That argument triggered me more and more. The only thing I'll say on it is... Okay. Well, people won't go to war because war is expensive. Uh, yeah, let's just ignore the thousands of years of colonialism that happened. Uh, they must have just been all <laughs> stupid and not realized that you could go to war for a profit. I mean, ah, yes, all, all colonial countries were made poorer because of their colonialism, both explicit and implicit. Uh, yes, that makes... That's a perfectly historical fact. That, no, of course not. Fucking war... <laughs> Is well, you could argue war is net wealth destroying in the sense that if we had a freer, more democratic, and sort of um, you know cooperative society, that we would have higher wealth than a world without you know colonialism and when wars and stuff like that. But war is profitable for some people, right? That's why war happens. That's why slavery happens. Well, that's not the only um, reason why war happens. No. I mean, there are there are there are non-economic no, reasons I, I, to go to it's war. It's not the only reason. I'm just saying that. You know, you, there's a moral Our case that many people will make for certain war, no. but it's just, you know, obviously, you know, uh, we can argue that slave economies, like, for instance, some economists will say that slave economies are inefficient and they're wealth destroying. But the reality is they make wealth for some people and just destroy a lot of wealth for other people. Right. <laughs> and that's yeah. why people own slaves when you're allowed to. So, you mm -hmm. know, the colonialism is the same thing. Obviously, in this society, you still have war, probably to arguably a greater <laughs> degree than we have now. So. Mm. Do you want to say something, Lilith? Oh, well, I had a thought. I'm really bad at keeping thoughts sometimes <laughs> when people just keep talking and I have to process new information. It's my <laughs> it's my medication I'm taking. It's, 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 uh, anyways, I'm not going to go into too, too much details. <laughs> I blame universal health care for this. You blame universal health care? I, I might be too opiated. <laughs> I'm, I'm just joking around i'm just joking around um i might be i'm i've been thinking about cutting it down <laughs> wait i was joking <laughs> um but yeah I, I generally agree that just drink water just just drink that's all you gotta do just 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 to, just drink water and you know eat organic food it'll solve every problem you have Eat organic food. Eat raw meat like Jordan Peterson. <laughs> <laughs> I think he eats raw meat. I think he just eats only meat. He eats like he eats like organs and stuff, eh? He like fries liver. I, this is some weird like I think he's on on some weird meat meat only diet. Yeah, I think the raw meat's only a meme. You know, I actually I wouldn't mind trying a raw meat. No, not raw meat. Like a meat only diet, just to see what it was like. I think to get all the vitamins that you need, you have to eat organs as well. You can't just like only yeah. eat pure protein. Organ meat and bones. Or yeah. no, not bones, but yeah, organ yeah. meat basically. Yeah, might be but, fun. Oh, right. I remember my point. I was oh. gonna make um, like um, the counter argument to like the wars actually being profitable aspect. I think their point would probably be that it's not profitable on an individual scale or it's not as profitable. Like you have to convince an entire nation to go to war. Like, uh, and only certain people profit from it. I think well, I mean, like, war, uh, war, war profiteering yeah. works a lot better under the apparatus of a state than without it. Yeah. I mean, war, war on an individual scale is just basically just, individual conflict right and I, I think i would say the same thing which is that like you know we could argue that me going into your house and stealing your you know washing machine or something is like net like a net economic drain because why have is to, that like, the example <laughs> you know well i'm just saying like you know that, no, like, i get it i get it just net, funny. net yeah. economic drain because you have to like work extra hours or like you've had unproductive labor now at this point and the washing machine is like lower quality because i've just had to steal it and this you know stuff like that but it was profitable for me because I fucking got a washing machine for free. So, I mean, um, it's, a, it's a similar argument, right? Why does anyone rob anyone else, right? It's because it's uh, profitable for them for to do to so. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, you can... It'll be very you know, costly for that, you. Mm. But that's a priced in cost of any sort of robbery or conflict. Like, if I'm, if I'm robbing your house, I know that obviously there's a chance you wake up in the middle of the night and, like, you know, shoot me and kill me. And similarly, if, if I go to war with you, I, I mean, I'm assuming you're not just going to 
do nothing about it, right? So, I mean, that's uh, that's usually priced in whenever someone makes the decision to to rob someone or uh, you know you know co- co- colonize uh, another people. Yeah, you can make a rational calculation on that. I think you can be like, well, you know, there's a certain percentage yeah. chance that I'm going to get shot and die, but there's another percentage chance that I'll get away with whatever I get away with. So you can like see if you want to roll the dice yeah. on that. You can like, you can you can kind of figure that kind of stuff out. And I guess right. like let's keep it going. Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Phone owner on the other side of it you'd be outnumbered and outgunned and what's going to happen once a bunch of your mercenaries get killed the rest are going to say it's not worth it and just go home of course in all of these different scenarios we're assuming the criminal survives his attempt but remember people have the right to keep and bear arms and enough of them would exercise that right that any criminal would be taking a big chance not even a mass shooter would have much of an opportunity a guy named dobby barker did a study of over 100 mass shootings and found that when the shooter was stopped by police the average number of people killed was 14.29 but when stopped by an armed citizen that number dropped to 1.8 so maybe now you understand why is mass killing is pretty much only happening in gun zones the fact is, you'd have to be 20 miles south of stupid to try something like that in an anarcho-capitalist society. Something else we get over and over again is, who would help the poor? But the fact is, government just doesn't do that good of a job at helping the poor. Before the welfare state, the poverty rate was dropping like a stone, and the poor enjoyed huge amounts of upward mobility. The poor in one year were pretty much different people than the poor the next year, who were pretty much immigrants, young people, and other new entrants into the workforce. But Johnson's so-called great society with his wonderful welfare program stopped that in its tracks. The poverty rate is now a pretty consistent 15%, and we've also seen the destruction of a lot of private charities for the poor, including free clinics and charity hospitals. But let's consider the real issue. How much of our wealth is government soaking up? Government at all levels... Okay, hold on, hold on. This is actually something I wanted to ask you for a while now, Econom Boy. So... I've read some Thomas Sowell, and he makes an argument at some point that the Great Depression was recovering on its own, but government intervention caused it to, the, was it was it the the New Deal or whatever caused it to basically go yep. a lot longer than it than it should have. Is that does that have any merit to it? Um, no, not really. I mean, like <laughs> just um, like nope. We, we, we... <laughs> Well, we'd have we have to think about like specific programs, right? So it's hard mm. to say like um, you know, like oh yeah, the 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 government generic intervention caused like all these problems, right? Um, you know, if anything, people argue the opposite end that the government didn't go far enough in during the Great Depression because during the Great Depression, uh, the central bank actually decided that um, they didn't want to inject liquidity into the market in order to save financial institutions from the Great Depression. And 5,000 banks ended up, you know, basically closing and going bankrupt. Now, you could say, hey, that's a good thing. These banks weren't, you know, collateralized enough. They made too many risky investments and they closed down, right? That's the free market. Now, the trouble is that all that depositor money before FDIC insurance was gone. Like, there were so many people, like, just regular everyday people that were fucked, right? Um, Because they, you know, entrusted their money to those institutions. And so um, those were... uh, you know, that exacerbated the Great Depression, if anything. But, you know, stuff like Social Security, the Ten- uh, I don't know if the Tennessee Valley Authority was a uh, New Deal artifact, but, you know, basically like huge investments in infrastructure, Social Security. I mean, these are things that um, there are some things where the private market sort of systemically underinvests in, right? And it's usually things that require, uh, usually things that don't have a return. So like old people that can't work, that's one. Um, and then the other one is things that have a return, but it takes a really long time to get it. So, you know, you can think of infrastructure, um, or like a lot of medical research as an example of that. Right. Um, and so, uh, these are things that the new deal invested in and it's kind of, I don't know, you're hard pressed from my perspective to imagine a world where, uh, the new deal just didn't like the government just didn't do anything. And the hmm. people in the United States were made better off uh, for that. That's, that seems right. I will, pretty unlikely. It's been a while. So I will reread the soul stuff that is relevant and I'll ask you with more. Yeah. Maybe details. he goes into detail on it. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, yeah it's I been a few years. So. That would be helpful, but all right, let's, let's roll. It takes about 52% of the national income in taxes, fees, and so on. So already we're left with just 48% of our purchasing power. But that's hardly the whole story. Government also robs from us through inflation. They've... Oh, by the way, I, I don't know. I, I paused it really quick. Um, you see some conservatives say this, like the government takes a majority of your, your wealth and, and um, a majority of your income or whatever in taxes. It's like there's just no there's no statistic to back this up. I don't know where people get this from. Like maybe I, I remember I heard someone once say that, well, if you add in all the fees that governments charge and you add in inflation, we get to a majority. And it's like, number one, I don't even know if that's true, right? But 
at the very least, all the statistics that I've been able to find, it's like, you know, the government does not does not take a majority of the average person's income in, uh, you know, in, in, in taxes. That's true for some, like, maybe if you're a, making $10 million a year, like, yeah, maybe you paid $6 million in taxes or something. I don't know. It depends on the country, but, you know, certainly for poor and lower, poor and middle income and, you know, upper middle income money people, at you're not. every turn, though. They can. Yeah, yeah that's like true. Sales, I mean, sales tax, double taxation tax. is a yeah. yeah, yeah, double taxation is a thing. I'm just saying, like, it's not, it's not a majority of anyone's income. Like, I don't, I don't know if, like, uh, it's yeah, that's they all I can really take, say. Like, it might take part of your income, but then they take it when you buy, go buy stuff, when you go drive, when you go, just, when you have to go go back to work to make more money, and then when you, when you sell stuff, yeah, you but you, 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 stuff, you, you could just you take yeah, yeah stuff, but you could just look at. Then, just once every year again because it's fuck you <laughs> the fuck you tax yeah, you, once you, a year <laughs> you, you could just take taxes as a percentage of gross national income and it's not a majority in like any country basically like there, there are some countries where it gets to like 40 percent 45 percent even um but not a not a majority anywhere like even in the most like you know, socialist countries like Iceland or Norway or something like that. Um, much less than the United States. I mean, that's, it's, uh, and that includes local taxes, you know? So, I mean, it's, I don't know. What is the highest it form of like... taxation? It's no, it's not. I mean, but even it, if you it, include inflation, it doesn't, it doesn't count. I think inflation you know, it, it is kind of a form of taxation. I think it is. But I, I, like, what, what is the highest bracket in the United States? It's like 30, 50? Yeah, 40? 37. 37? Yeah, thirty-seven percent. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of taxes, though. Jesus, Jesus Christ. Well, thirty-seven percent income tax, but you don't pay you don't pay payroll tax at that bracket, right? So your oh, you payroll don't? tax is only up. Well, your your social security contribution is only up to I think one hundred forty thousand a year, and so every dollar after one hundred forty thousand, you don't pay any payroll tax on it. You don't you don't pay any. Uh, I'm, I keep on saying payroll tax. You don't pay any social security tax on it. Oh, okay. Um, All right. And so you know you you uh. You, you and to be fair, I don't think that's how it should be. I think you should pay, you know, no, Connor boy, no, every goddamn dollar you make, but absolutely um, not. At the, cringe. But <laughs> at the same time, though, I just, uh, you know, in America, it, America is a, a, a relatively lower tax country compared to many other developed countries in the world. And, um, no, we don't certainly in America, not even close to a majority of your income is, is paid in taxation. Okay, all right. Maybe they're just buying a lot of high tax goods or something. I don't know. Yeah, you're just, <laughs> you're just uh, donating your money to the state. <laughs> We've been doing it continuously since the Federal Reserve was created, such that a dollar is now only worth 4% of what it was then. But let's not go back that far. In fact, let's actually skip the 70s, since that was very much an unusual situation. So let's go all the way to 1988, the last year of the Reagan era, when the economy was doing pretty good. According to Westdeck Inflation Calculator, $1.1988 $1 is the equivalent of $2.06 in 2016. So if government had stopped inflation at that point and went to sound money, each dollar we earn would go twice as far. But no, our dollars only have about 48% of their purchasing power compared to what they did in 1988. Figure that in. 48% of 48% is 23%. So now, government is robbing us of 77% of our purchasing power. But we're not done yet. Government also imposes indirect costs in the form of regulations. We'll show you in a minute how out of control the regulatory state is. But for now, according to a 2013 study in the Journal of Economics Growth, the cost of all this regulation is 277000 a year to the average American family. Our GDP would be $54 trillion instead of just $16 trillion. We are 75% poorer because of federal regulations. And that's not even counting state and local regulations. So basically, we're left with 25% of 48% of 48%, leaving us with less than 6% of our purchasing power. And we know that's lowballed because remember, we're not counting state and local regulations or businesses that have been driven out by these costs. So without government, our paychecks will be going over 17 times as far as they are now. Think about this next time you hear this fight for 15 nonsense. Understand that because of government, this... Well, wouldn't you also be getting paid a lot less? I mean, infl it, I can... because of what? Well... They're assuming that, like, if you make twenty dollars an hour right now, you'd still be making twenty dollars an hour in this hypothetical world where there was no inflation for the past fifty years or something. I don't think that's the case at all. Yeah, I mean, there's problems with. Um, to be fair, though, they didn't say like make the inflation target zero. I think they mentioned having a. Um, I th they they use some they use a phrase that I've never heard before. I think it was like stable currency or something. But I think they're talking about like basically commodity backed currency. Um, gold, we, we about baby. Before, but gold. Like, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why um, 
there's a lot of reasons why a commodity backed currency is is worse and uh, if you look at you know real personal incomes and you know stuff like that um you know wait basically median wages over time uh you know it's we've we've gotten we've we've gotten richer since the 1980s and especially since the gold standard i think that the average I can look at the 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 data real quick, but I mean, since the 1970s, I think it was 70, I think it was 76 when we got rid of the gold standard, like officially, officially. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, incomes are up like 50 percent since since then, and that's in real terms. Like that's beyond inflation. Incomes are up 50 percent on median. So, you know, I don't. Okay, uh, that's I, I didn't. I, didn't know I definitely that. don't agree. I, I know you and I talked about inflation yeah. the first time we talked, and I was like, explain to me. Yeah. The gold, the gold question, and inflation and printing well, cause, money. Because their and all argument of it. is like they're they're just they're making the argument like, ah yes, uh, one dollar is worth less today than a dollar in the nineteen seventies or eighties, and it's like, yeah, but that can be true, but still we're a lot wealthier than we were in the nineteen seventies and eighties. I guess the argument that like the, the real argument would be like, well, how much more wealthier or less wealthier would we have been if we still had, you know, gold as a, as a reserve currency? And, uh, you know, I think that that's a, that's a harder argument to make, I guess, but it's, mm. it's, uh, certainly I don't think, a uh, it's not a good argument. I don't think from the anarchist side. So this, this chatter here says basically what I was thinking. The best argument for oh, gold God. is the same as the worst argument for gold. The government will struggle to manipulate the economy. It's like, yeah, fair enough. I mean, you mentioned before, I think when we first talked, you mentioned that uh, a gold-backed dollar is very rigid. And I don't think you explained what rigid meant, but I took from that to mean that basically it was kind of out of your hands if you needed more money to to fund more production because you ha- you only you basically had uh, dollars. T- the dollar-gold c- conversion was, was the standard. So it's like, well, if your government's out of gold, you're fucked, even if you need to be able to get people working. Well, kind of. I mean, sort of yes and sort of no. So, like, um, uh, so on one hand, as far as I understand the implementation of the gold standard in, like, a contemporary sense, when I say contemporary, I mean, like, you know, after ye olden days. Um, <laughs> We're not talking, like, prospectors was, with, like, um, gold coins and, like, biting them and stuff. Yeah. Is that it was the it was the government that guaranteed the gold, right? So that's kind of a problem because banks issue currency as well. Um, and so to the extent that we have basically a functioning banking system and you've got a scenario where banks are issuing currency, but people still expect to redeem it in gold, you all of a sudden have to have so much more gold and you can't really control the money supply because banks can issue loans with, um, you know, with fractions of what they actually have in reserves. So that's one thing. Um, you could argue for full reserve banking, but that's an even crazier idea than a gold standard um, in general. And is it? Uh, with regards to the other sort of problem is that the government can always just devalue how much gold you get per dollar or how many you know units of currency or whatever, which is where um, a lot of the sort of postmodern economies ended up going, which was just, oh, you know, we're having trouble meeting basically, we're having trouble having as much gold in reserve as we have in currency in circulation. Um, so we'll just devalue how much you know, gold you get per dollar, um, which I guess people could say, well, well, I mean, I'm advocating for the government not to even be able to do that, in which case you probably just end up with, you know, more problems. I mean, governments, you know, democratic countries want good economies because you don't get reelected when the economy is bad. And so you have to think to yourself, right, like, why would they choose to devalue the currency rather than keep it the same? if it was truly better for the economy in all instances. And it's, I don't know, I just, uh, you know, I don't think it's a big banking conspiracy. I just think, uh, you know, it's, it's better for the economy to have a fiat currency. You know, I don't think all the countries in the world are dumb. I think they do it because it's uh, provides more flexibility and it's um, easier to weather recessions when you have a fiat currency and you can, you know, more quickly and effectively inject money into the system. But then that leads to further devaluation. Well, it does, but devaluation is only as relevant as your real incomes are going up or down, right? So uh, if you have a scenario where you can control inflation with a fiat currency uh, to where it's low and stable, which you know has been the case for basically the last 40 years up until this supply chain crisis, which, you know, give them a little bit of credit on that, um, 
and you've got a scenario where real incomes are rising, you know, beyond inflation, then I don't really see what the problem is. I mean, the only sort of external effect of that is that you have more fiscal space, right? The so problem you can, with that is yeah. that income rarely rises as fast as the, co the cost of living, the cost of everything else. It doesn't, like, though. Uh, I mean, at least in America, we've, I mean, like I said, since, since the late 70s, um, incomes are up 50% in real terms. You know, that's a pretty significant it, difference in the standard of living. Yes, yeah. but how much is the cost of everything else on top well, of that's that? That's what I'm saying. In, I mean, it used to be term. way. It used to be really cheap to just put yourself through college or own a house or yeah. buy a car and, and all that stuff. It's just things are it feels like everything right now, yeah. is is way harder to get, and you have to work way harder for stuff people yeah. took for granted. It's just several well, decades are, ago. Well, there are some things that have become more expensive, but I don't think that's a result of the gold standard going away, right? It's like, I don't think the gold standard going away made housing more expensive, right? Um, I think that what made housing more expensive, arguably, you know, to free marketeers' credits is a lot of bad regulation um, and also not enough, uh, basically, government uh, social works in terms of building housing, right? That's what made housing more expensive. Um, you know, college degree premiums are still really, really high, um, and there's a whole bucket of worms with regards to why college has gotten more expensive in the first place, but... Again, I don't think it got more expensive because of the gold standard um, going away. So, and again, that that just you know that's beside or, the point though because hmm. you know the broad cost of society, people are more much more wealthy today than they were in the 1970s. So, and that's that's hmm. uh, probably a degree of magnitude more wealthy than they were in the 19 uh, you know 1940s and 50s. The data just doesn't go uh, back. You have to get more historical in your analysis. But I, I don't know if that translates to quality of life and wealth in the sense of being able to yeah, be self actualizing and yeah, afford a house or afford you know yeah. it does seem like people have a harder time right now buying the things that their parents bought, you know? Yeah, and I mean, a, and that product large product of that is the devaluation of your savings and and well, no, because, the it's climbing just, costs assuming... of housing would also mm -hmm. incur more property taxes and all that stuff. Everything's more expensive because of inflation. Yeah, but we're, it's just, again, we're, we're assuming that the, the problem is that the things that you guys are mostly describing, like it seems like cars and houses are the main things, um, those well, things they're, they're are big things that people think about. And yeah, they're, they're, they're yeah, like your big assets, yeah. like your, yeah, your, that, your car and your house and stuff. that's kind of what I'm saying, right? It's just, mm -hmm. I just don't, I don't see why having a gold-backed mm -hmm. currency would necessarily mean that the market structure is that are causing housing to be more expensive wouldn't exist, right? Um, it seems like those things would be sort of held equal. And, but your money wouldn't you know, be devalued as much. No, but what I'm saying is that like it doesn't it doesn't matter if your money's devalued because we're talking about relative increase in price. So if we're talking generic increase in price, we've already had real incomes going up by fifty percent over the last you know forty fifty years or whatever. I it is. think now, I understand. If we're talking, yeah, if we're talking in a relative sense, like oh, you know, your um, your housing is going up much faster than your other costs, um, That there's no reason why the gold standard would f solve that problem, right? We would just yeah, see yeah. the same problems because it's market failures Here, that are happening. Maybe I regard. can describe it in a different way to see, if, to, see if we're, to see if at least I understand what you're saying. Okay, so let's say it's an alternate universe where we still have the gold standard. So the government can't just necessarily print money because the gold is, is the money, okay? Well, if that's the case... Let's say let's say we've got like we're carrying around bags of gold coins instead. We're like we don't even have paper money. It's gold coins, okay? And nonetheless, you can still have housing regulations that prevent the building of apartment buildings. So everything being built built is like urban sprawl, and so it's all a bunch of like single occupant houses. And so then then the uh, pl the places where poor people want to have to like rent an apartment, there's no apartment building, so they're renting houses instead. So the so the price of housing goes up. And so you still have a situation where rather than buying your house for a thousand gold coins, now your house costs ten thousand gold coins to buy. So there, there's other factors at play yeah. than just printing money. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and if okay. anything, a fiat currency allows governments to more easily build housing, right? Because you can e more easily run a deficit to invest in things like you know public transportation and mm -hmm. you know public housing. If you if you don't have to have you know like you said literal gold coins or you know in the case of you know commodity money you know or not commodity money but like you know uh what do you call it uh current uh 
gold backed currency, you know, the gold standard. you have to have gold that's, you know, on a reserve of um, your currency. It's a lot harder to invest in those kind of things. So, okay, I think I think I get it. To be fair, though, this is this is why I'm actually just pro fascist. And by the way, okay. because every time you have all of these democracy cucks who are voting for NIMBY shit, it ruins everything. So no, I will be the benevolent dictator that builds the apartment buildings we all need. Well, hey, you know, eminent domain exists in our current system. <laughs> so maybe you don't need a full-blown fascist takeover of the government. First, we just need to abolish, like, single-family-only housing. What do you mean? Well, hey, that's, that requires a government act, Lilith. My goodness. No, no, that's, that's, rebu- uh, that, no, no, that's abolishing current, current regulations that are already in place that allows... For- oh, okay, when you... Well, when you say abolish single-family housing, I thought you meant oh, no, you shouldn't I, I be meant allowed to build a single-family house. Single-family housing zoning laws. Zoning, <laughs> yeah, single-family yes. zoning. I see. Oh, yeah. zoning, not. Oh, I heard owning. Oh, I was like, oh my god, abolish uh, owning housing. I was like, Jesus. No, no, zoning. <laughs> no, I get it. I get it. Yes. Are you? <laughs> I love owning houses and and owning properties. It's it's good. Hmm. It's. I guess you're just. Abolish that. Let's, let's let's keep rolling. Let's keep going. This means they want you to have the purchasing power of just 86 cents an hour. The rest gets absorbed by this behemoth of a government. And you say we need government to help the poor. Ask yourself, how many poor people would we actually have when someone working at a job that makes just $6,000 a year would have the purchasing power of someone currently making over 100000 It's not even any contest. Poor people would be a thing of the past. Another argument that statists make goes along the lines uh, of, well, if okay. the government doesn't regulate businesses, then what will stop them from exploiting their workers as well as the consumer? Yeah, they love using that word exploit. It doesn't really mean anything, but it sounds bad. See, the thing is, in an anarcho-capitalist society, you get to vote with your dollars. So if a company starts to be unethical towards its workers or gouges prices, then all you have to do is support its competitors or stop buying from them, and they will either have to correct this behavior or go under. And of course workers will be free to work elsewhere. If someone's not giving their workers good conditions or the pay they deserve or whatever, there will be a financial incentive for a competing businessman to offer them a job with better pay and conditions. By the way, don't let them snow you. We don't have a problem with people getting together and voluntarily forming labor unions. We're all for free association, and unions that were set up in the past like this offered their workers a lot of benefits, including health benefits, unemployment insurance, and many others. We only object when government monopolizes it. They only allow one particular union to exist in the industry, and they force all workers in the industry to join. But then what incentive do those unions have to make their workers happy or feel they're getting value for their dues? It, it, Another argument that on. gets used alongside is, well... Is that the current state of unions, though? That the government I've forces unions? No. <laughs> you, you're you're not in America. I, I don't... You're both like, don't yes, don't no, yes, yes, no, yes, no, yes, <laughs> no. It's not government like, enforced, but it's like... Contract Lots enforced, of places, yeah. You only get only one mm. union to choose yeah, from. Yeah, yeah. And there's, um, you're not allowed to start alternative ones. Mm. Some places have sectoral unions where it's like one union for the whole, basically the whole sector. Actually, um, there are now, like government official force unions, like uh, teacher use unions and government. Oh, yeah, for, for like public, public servants. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah, now. yeah, that's true. But um, that's uh, kind of a, a little bit different. But um, and as far as I'm aware, I think that uh, sometimes unions aren't necessarily statewide. So sometimes you might just have like the individual district teachers might have to choose a teacher's union. But it's not a, a, a hard and fast rule. Um, that's just to say that, you know, sectoral unions, I think that um, a lot of times union um, unions themselves, especially when they're very big, have democratic apparatuses. Right. So to the extent, again, that you can vote in and out your union reps and your union president. Um, I don't think that that necessarily creates a big problem with regards, because he's basically saying that, again, it's like monopoly, therefore, you know, bad because competition better. It's like (laughs) we don't necessarily need a bunch of unions competing because to some extent, well, to a great extent, the power of a union is only uh, completely proportional to how many members they have and how how much, you know, collective action they can inspire. Um, and so to me, so long as your union operates within, within a relative democratic framework, um, I don't really have a big problem with there only being like big major unions, especially if they're sector wide, but uh, personally, but a what about the teamsters, they're corrupt as fuck. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, it's, it's just like, you know, the, the same arguments would apply with regards to the police force. Right. So, um, you know, it's, uh. You know, there's examples of corrupt police, there's examples of corrupt unions, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, like, the institution should be wholly decentralized, um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, reform from uh, within is uh, totally impossible. Now, to be fair, in the United States and in most countries, sectoral unions are not, like, 
that popular as far as I'm able to read. There's some countries with sectoral unions. I think uh, I want to say some Nordic countries have sectoral unions, but even even a lot of Nordic countries mostly rely on um, just indiv- like individual big unions, right, which aren't sector wide. So um, but I need to do more reading on that uh, in general. But it's I do agree to some extent, like the um, you know uh, something that people that defend China will say is like, ah, yes, every worker in China is unionized because the you know, government approved union is representing <laughs> them. And it's like, well, one of the advantages of unions is that they're independent, not only of the company, but also the government, right? Because you don't want the government to be able to tell you, you know, you, uh, you know, hey, steel workers at this national steel company represented by the national steel government approved union. Yeah, you're not allowed to strike because fuck you. We need you to produce steel because we're China and we can tell you what to do. That yeah. kind of defeats, to some great extent, the purpose of a union. So. Yeah. F- fascist Italy was the exact same way. I've, I've been doing a lot of reading about their economic system uh, since we last talked about it, in fact. And yeah, there was a lot of like nationalized unions for just for an entire sector of the ind- of, of the uh, of the economy, and it was all yeah. just state controlled, all just state controlled stuff. Well, it's funny because a lot of a lot of fascists will they'll say. No, 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 we're not advocating for China's economic model. And then they proceed to literally verbatim describe exactly how China runs their economy. And then a lot of <laughs> socialists will say, no, 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 we're not fascist. And then they'll describe the Chinese economy, and it's the exact thing that fascists, <laughs> in terms of <laughs> economics, advocate for. <laughs> it's like, guys, let's just be real here. Like, if fascist economics is a real thing, which is a disputed topic, I mean, China pretty well fits that mold. So, mm. you know. That's all right. That's that's a roll. We're we're oh, we're, we're, we're so close to the end. Than the free market regulating itself. When in reality, the government puts out thousands of new regulations a day that generally benefit those who lobby for said regulations. Take a look at the Federal Register. Each business day, the federal government publishes all of the regulations that just went into effect. All of the regulations that take effect in that day. Here's a page from the one for November 20th, 2017. Look at how small the type is. And this is 278 pages long, not counting things like the table of contents. If this were typeset like a novel, it would be over 1,100 pages. These things generally have 1,000 words a page, and it's common to have 200 pages or more. Let's do some math. Many words, words, much information, every day. reading hard. speed in the U.S. is about 300 words per minute, so that would take reading the average hard. adult over 11 Indeed. hours just to read the new regulations <laughs> that went into effect just the previous day, and they would have to do it all over again the next day. Now, you're probably going to point out that many of these regulations won't apply to your business. That's true, but how are you going to know which regulations don't apply without reading it? So, tell us, statist, how is thousands of new regulations a day more simple than not supporting unethical behavior and letting that company go out of business? Now, your biggest question is probably... <laughs> it's so funny that at the same time, NCAPS will be like, yeah, it's not unreasonable for people to have a, you know, be able to shop around rationally for doctors and have a basic medical knowledge and a basic mechanical knowledge and a basic dental knowledge and a basic knowledge on basically every fucking aspect of human <laughs> Spend life. Spend all this time. To, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's not unreasonable to have people read up on all of that shit. You know, but to have people read, you know, a piece of legislation, apparently that's where the that's where the line is drawn. You know, my argument in this regard would just be that, you know, at least at least with regards to legislation, it's a central body. Right. There's only there's there's one place making it. Right. Imagine if you had terms and conditions for like every single aspect of life. You know, that would be, uh, you know, <laughs> we, we are getting there in a strange way, though. Huh. Well, that's yeah. true, but I mean, hey, you know, I mean, that's just an argument against them where it's like, ah, oh, yes, companies would do this so much simpler. And it's like, have you ever read the fucking Apple terms and conditions? That shit's like a thousand pages, too. I mean, that's not simple to read either. So, mm. you know, I don't know. I, yeah. uh, I disagree with the idea that uh, reading hard and also I disagree with the idea that, uh, you know, it seems like this contradictory narrative of like uh, reading hard, companies make reading easier for consumers. Like, eh, it mm. seems like, you know, when left to their own devices, companies would rather prices be opaque a lot of the times. So prices and sort of product information be opaque a lot of the times. So so I've got only 40 minutes left. So let's get through this. Let's keep going. Probably That's what will prevent monopolies from forming in Kapistan? The truth is, the only thing that makes monopolies is government. Big business influences law and writes law via lobbying. Basically, government's handing out monopolies to whichever big company has money. See, that's what happens when you have rulers. Rulers will always sell you out for money. Without government, there's no way for monopolies to form. If there's no government, there's no rulers. And if there's no rulers, everybody's on an equal playing field. And that's how it should be. Imagine we're in an anarcho-capitalist society and you have the only fidget spinner company. You have a monopoly on fidget spinners. Now, I'm a smaller company and I want to make fidget spinners too and steal the crap out of your monopoly. What are you going to do to stop me? Go ahead. I'll wait. Do-do-do-do-do. Do-do-do. There's nothing you can do. 
Well, I have, a, I have a, an idea here. I mean, if you have a larger company, you probably have, you've probably integrated yourself along the supply chain. There's, there's the, the economy of scale is there, and so you can better fend off competition by driving your, your prices down until they go to business. Is that about, yeah. that's about right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah that, that's basically what, um, I mean, that was what inspired the Roosevelt government to break up Standard Oil, right? It was Standard Oil would come in and, you know, buy out all the local oil producers and then fucking raise the prices right afterwards, right? All the gas stations and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, that was... Um, if it's like a startup, yeah, you can part just... Part of the basis for that. If you're a big do company... again with all the rental companies. <laughs> oh, yeah, all, like, the buying all the houses and shit. Jesus. You know, yeah. in, in Canada, the problem is a little bit different. It's not... Like, there is some rental companies here that are fucking things up for sure. But out in BC, um, what's happening there in Vancouver is that... Basically, a lot of rich people in China, they're hiding their wealth from the, the Chinese Communist Party by buying property in Vancouver. And it's like, well, yeah, you kind of need that, that, that housing, dude. I understand your government sucks, but yeah. like, fuck. <laughs> You're not even no, living there. Sense. Yeah. All right, let's... Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, that's where things like vacancy taxes and like limitations on foreign investment can actually be, you know... Net, All we net should do is, to mm-hmm. is abolish property taxes for your first house. You think so? Only yeah. tax, no. only tax second houses. And I think, I think if you own a house, you should actually own it instead of having to pay rent to a government every month, or hmm. like every twice a year. Hmm. Um. I I don't know if that to me makes as much sense as a. Uh, replacing a property tax with a land value tax right oh god are we gonna uh, econoboy are you you a georgist no i think georgists have broader ideas of like decommodifying land altogether which i'm not i (laughs) i mean i think you should be able to buy land if you want you know it doesn't seem like a big deal to me um but uh but a land value tax i mean the thing is it it just aligns a lot of incentives so mm-hmm. you know it, it instead of like a property tax almost discourages development whereas a land value tax encourages it <laughs> yeah and it raises about the same amount of revenue so um but in theory dollar for dollar it should raise the exact same amount of revenue so um you know i i i like that a lot more i think that just getting rid of property taxes um i just think that 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 would cause a lot of problems for a oh, lot I of... Did, I didn't say get rid of property taxes. I said get rid of it for a per, an individual's first house. So if you own... If yeah. they wish to own additional yeah. houses and let them sit vacant half the year, then that's Pay a taxes. different story. Yeah. Well, but then but then we're, we're just... At that point, though, we're just... We're limiting, like, 75% of property taxes, right? I just think there'd be a lot of... Um, there'd be a lot of problems <laughs> with regards to... Uh, well, yeah, that's what I'm saying. If you, if you were advocating for replacing it with uh, with another sort of superior form of taxation, that would be one thing. But with regards to, you know, just, cut, you know, cutting school, you know, school funding by 50% because you need that, those well, local you property find, taxes. You just find school funding through other forces. Why does it have to be to property taxes. You see, That's I, what I'm saying. You know, you could argue yeah. for alternative forms of taxation, but you just you haven't you haven't mentioned like you haven't mentioned where that money would okay. come from yet. So Out of curiosity, it like you said, is yeah, go on. Is it the case in the United States that, I, that well, that, I, didn't, I don't have to have an alternative to say that <laughs> it's immoral to tax people on the only house they have. All taxes um, are immoral, Lilith. All of them. <laughs> well, well, hold on, though. Hold on. I, 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 Fair I, enough. I, I really want to want to kind of drill down I, a little I don't bit here. <laughs> um, just is it is it is it true in the United States that the funding that a school gets is based on the taxation in the area the school is in? Yeah, for the most part. Like, there's obviously state and federal funding for schools, but if you look at a school budget, it's primarily going to be property taxes that like, makes up a school budget that sounds fucking retarded dude like what the fuck well you're not, <laughs> well, you're not the first one to make that argument i mean it's just the issue is that it's it's kind of like nimbyism again right it's like you know people in wealthier neighborhoods they don't want like one unified school district they don't want equitable funding because from their perspective it's like why would we want more funding going to schools that aren't the schools that my kids are going to <laughs> and um <laughs> On one hand, Jesus. I can. On well, one hand, I, I can understand that kids. argument. 
Yeah, you, yeah, yeah you exactly. Kids, that's yeah, the argument yeah. that I would make, which is that like, well, by that logic, every single person in your district that is paying those high property taxes that doesn't have kids shouldn't have to pay for that school, which I don't think most people would agree with, right? Some people might, but I, I mean, no, I don't. I think a robust, equitably funded public education is what, you know, broader yeah. society would prefer. But we have local control of, of schools and, you know, local uh, school districts have decided that, you know, property taxes is, is uh, how they want to raise revenue. So I, I don't think we have that system here in Canada. I'm pretty sure we don't that it's I think it comes just from like provincial taxes. Which means that the yeah, I wouldn't are be surprised like, if Canada yeah. has less local control, given how uh, you know you guys are all socialist up there anyway. So yeah, god damn it, god damn it, fucking central planning and shit. <laughs> Actually, we we have a lot of devolved powers to the provincial governments. It's quite nice, just not quite as much oh, as really? you guys to the Is states. That right? Yeah. Tell that to the conservatives running in the conservative leadership election in Canada. Then, my God, you'd oh. think it was a friggin' you'd think it was a friggin' living in China or something. By the way, they're talking goodness. I think they're just they're just like they have their feathers ruffled about Trudeau not letting up any of the of the federal covid restrictions even though at this point like nobody cares anymore. I think they're just Look, I'm all that. for it, okay? Just have Justin Trudeau plan the entire economy. <laughs> Jesus That's Christ. That's what makes the most sense. I don't think he plans his own outfits. He he clearly does. He's a well-dressed man. <laughs> That's why I don't think he plans them. I think somebody else does. Wow. Okay. He planned his okay. outfits at one point. It didn't go so well for him. <laughs> oh yeah, he went he wore the black face. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> god dude, Canadian politics is so fucked. Okay. Let's let's go. Keep going. There's let's no government going. for you to buy and lobby, so there's no way for you to push me out of business. If I want, I'm gonna just compete with you and steal your monopoly now. There's nothing you can do about it. Now, a common argument is that the monopoly will just buy off any competitors that spring up. But if your business is at all successful, it'll be really attractive to competitors. How can you buy them all off without going bankrupt? Even if you tried, all it would do is create an incentive for even more competitors. Make a new fidget spinner company, and the monopoly will buy you out. Fast, easy money. Yes, all you'd be doing is creating a market for competitive startups. There's no way that's sustainable. Buy them off, and they win. Don't buy them off, and they still win. The truth is, monopolies can only oh, form God. when there's somebody with a monopoly right. of power. So without government, that doesn't exist, and there's nobody to divvy out power. And if there's no power being divvied out, there's nobody being exploited, and everybody's on an equal playing field. You know, the way it should be. When you put all these arguments under simple observation and critical thinking, they aren't very logical and fall apart under the slightest criticism. And whatever arguments you may have, chances are we've already responded to it. So before you come in with your argument for the state, how about checking Google or YouTube to see if there's already a response? You can save us and you a lot of time that way. And please remember, we can't teach you economics in 140 characters. When we send you to all these other sources, it's because we want you to bone up on the basics so we can have an informed discussion. This has been an introduction to anarcho-capitalism. I'm Reason. And I'm the video's over. <laughs> and I'm Lord Killian. If you enjoyed the video, please like and share. But there's still two minutes, okay. O'Connell boy. No. They said the video's <laughs> over. They already—they even said it themselves. Yeah. What, what, what is left anyway? All right. Oh, it's, it's okay. Yeah. It's, it's more lore. It's more lore. Okay. We can safely put this terrible part of our history behind us yeah if freaking viewers if viewers didn't freak out over 2x speed i would have watch advocated it, for 2x watch speed. the original by the way like most of these things we say yeah i always say watch it for yourself um just just to make your own opinion on it separate from our goof and don't watch it for yourself <laughs> <laughs> only that? listen to our opinions <laughs> forming your own opinion is way too time intensive guys mm. <laughs> Just, just listen to what we say. So I do one day, maybe next time we talk, Econo Boy. It can be with Lilith or without Lilith. I mean, I mean, you know, you're always, you're always invited along, Lilith, of course. But you know, depending on schedules, right? But we should actually yeah. do something about crypto because I like yeah. that idea. I just yeah. thought, I just thought it wasn't going to be this one. <laughs> but okay, yeah, let's let's let's. We cut it the future. Much next time. Yes. Let's see the supers. I want to see how much how much how, how much money have I been paid for you, for them to re that you're on Let's my channel it. again. Super chats. Yeah. Actually, speaking of our our mutual friend, um, hold on. Never mind. I didn't speak of it. I only thought the thought because I was going to say that we should we should do. <laughs> I, I was going to say that we should do another game with Taftage at some point, and then and those people. Yeah, that'd you, be fun. I had but fun she, last time. Well, she she has she has, she had some IRL stuff to she was offline for a bit, but we could, we, should, we should set it up. And then I was gonna say, think, speaking of podcast. her, speaking of her, she she um 
she messaged me during the during the stream. I gotta go check that later. Damn. Let's, let's see. She's probably talking shit about you. <laughs> <laughs> about 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 your cringe sock dem takes. About about Canadians. Jeez. Okay. So Shungite. Right, what for, did these hey sh- people say? Shungite for two bucks. Why didn't you get an end cap to talk about this? Um, because I, one, I'm not on. Well, I'm not on any on any good terms with any of them. <laughs> like personally, oh, no. I don't know any. Like I knew I knew a few, and now I don't. So, um. But also, like, I've heard ANCAPs talk, and I, like, I, I I agree with some of their first principles, and I don't agree with almost any of their conclusions. So, but I also, there are some things, especially about economics, that I, where I disagree, but I don't know why I disagree. And so I wanted somebody who knows economics, like you, Econoboy, to tell me why I don't agree, and you pretty much have. Fabian in Liberty yeah. says he's right here and he wants to talk. Oh, God. I don't know who Fabian Liberty is. Wait, hold on. You are, you know who Fabian Liberty is, right? Yeah, yeah, we talked once. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I only have. Yeah, I mean, I think. I have 30 minutes. I can't, I can't, I like, do Fabian. A, I can't do a thing right now. But yeah, yeah. yeah. You want to if you ever him? want to talk to him in the future, then that'd be fun. I mean, Fabian, I think to me, Fabian and last username, to me, they give, like, the palatable version of anarcho capitalism. Um, okay. Right. You know, uh, to me at least, and I, I don't agree. Obviously, I, <laughs> it was a debate when I really talked to those two guys. But um, you know, it's kind of like uh, to me. I said the same thing about like Matt Brunig. I think Matt Brunig's version of socialism is the most like reasonable version, but I mm. would still disagree. So okay, yeah, I, I can't bring him on now because I, I literally have thirty minutes. But if you want to set something up in the future, we can do that. Sure, I don't mind. Sounds yeah. gonna be fun. Yeah, I'm always happy to meet new people. Oh, let's see. Yeah. Yeah. Cody Doge for five dollars. All these criticisms involving straw manning and cap arguments and grossly misunderstanding how things work now. Oh, oh god. Um why? Like I, I know it's a super chat, so you can't put too many characters in it. But like the the problem with the you don't uh, understand any more characters from that person would have only <laughs> led to more of my fucking brain cells leaving my brain. <laughs> my God. <laughs> well, the thing is like in general, the problem with the, you don't understand <laughs> this reply to any argument is like, it, there's nothing to latch onto. Like, like, like there's to be more to it than that. Like you don't understand. Like, okay, fine. I don't understand. But like where, like how, you know, would I say that's wrong? Like there's, yeah. there has to be something more substantial than that. Okay. That's true. I don't know. I mean, it's kind of like we said at the very beginning where it seems like it, it seems like there's a lot of people online that will say you just don't understand X or Y and then it it seems like either they themselves don't understand it or um it turns out that you know, they explain it in a way where it's like, "No, I I totally like I got that already," you know, <laughs> and it can just be a little frustrating. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You see that a lot in like Twitch politics debates. It happens all the time. Yeah. Um, Let's see, Silver Camaro for two bucks. Dave and Naomi are Dev's property to do what he wants with. Based. Yes. <laughs> Agreed. Uh, Wimquin for $20. Thank you very much. Dev, I recommend you to check out Adam Friended's reading list. Almost all the books on it are amazing and eye-opening. Well, I, I am friends with Adam. I think you are too, Econo Boy. We're all friends. Yeah. And yeah. I've read my uh, videos. Yeah. I, I, I haven't gotten his list from him yet, but I have I know we, we've read some of the same books. So I'll 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 poke him if he has if he has like an, an official list now, I'll poke him for him. Okay. <laughs> Cockroach Man for five bucks. I love all caps. I love opioids. I can't go a day without opioids. I need my opioids. Alright. <laughs> well that's that's five dollars you can't put towards opioids, dude. That's yeah. Um, Someone asked why we didn't respond to a more recent ANCAP video. There, There is at least one guy who's an ANCAP who's like a viewer of mine who isn't around tonight. But he kept saying, watch this one, watch this one, watch this one. So this is the one that I chose. Um, let's see. Patrick for $5. You heard it here, folks. Lilith is a thought. <laughs> is that true? I sometimes can get brain fogs. I... S- I say that partially as a result of my meds, but it could also just be because I'm a stoner. <laughs> well, she, no, no, a, a thought, as in a a T H O T. 
<laughs> yes, I think that that was in in regards to um, my comments about uh, the medications. Oh, okay. I mean, <laughs> all right. I thought it might have been something more sexual, uh, I, but I do have my okay. bimbo moments. I'm sorry. Your bimbo but moments. Hey, it is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Silver Camaro for five dollars. Econo boy, do you have a master's in econ or just a bachelor's? And if you don't mind me asking, where did you get the degree? Yeah, I have a couple of master's degrees, one in economics, one in finance. Um, I don't share where I got my degree, just to keep that private, but I didn't, uh, certainly not Ivy League educated, let's just say. So. Oh, you have two, <laughs> eh? I didn't know you had two master's degrees. Okay. I do, I do, yeah. I just kind of, you know, most people end up doing grad, you know, they, they kind of work for a couple of years and then do grad school, and I, I worked, I just worked while I did grad school and basically was really really poor and tired all the time <laughs> in grad school. Yeah. Um, and uh, it was no fun, but I'm done now. So I, I ended up, uh, nice. you know, to, to me at least that was the easy thing to do because I, uh, I certainly didn't envy. It seemed like the much harder thing to do was what my classmates did, which was like work for five years, get a wife, start having kids. And then your, your kids are like three and five while you're getting your MBA at night. I mean, that sounds way harder. That sounds pretty rough. Yeah. What I did, which was like, you know, just burn through it all as quick as possible. So to be fair, I, when I got my bachelor's, I had dropped out work like blue collar jobs and then come back to it. And I basically, I wanted to get it done as fast as possible. So I, did, I worked night shift and then went to school during the day. And that was brutal, but I did it for like a year and a half and I just got it done. Um, then, then I, I was yeah. getting a master's and I just fucking, I, was, I don't want to do this anymore. Fuck this. I just left. Also, YouTube, no, I feel you. yeah, I mean, YouTube taking off kind of also kind of helped. <laughs> I was like, fuck it. I'm out YouTube and no. baby. <laughs> no, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, like part of my motivation for wanting to like get done with grad school was that like, my thought was that, you know, if I ever, if I ever get off this train, like, I don't think I'm ever going to want to go back, <laughs> you know? So like, yeah, I'd rather, you know. Because that's another thing that seemed so hard about what a lot of my classmates did. Like, a lot of my classmates in business school were, like, in their late 30s and 40s. And it's like, dude, how the fuck – how do you have – like, how do you know what life is like outside of school and then want to go back to that? Like, because now that I – because I knew – because that's what I thought would happen. Like, I would lose all motivation to go back to school if I left it. And, like, as soon as I graduated, got finally done with grad school, um, that, like – and then I just started working full time. I was like, oh, my God, my parents were wrong. Like, it's not hard being an adult. Like, being an adult is so much easier than being in school <laughs> while working. Like, oh, my God. Like, I have, like, twice as much. Free I literally started my YouTube channel. Like, that's what my origin of my YouTube channel was. Like, I have so much free time relative to when I was in grad school. Um, like, it's so, so much better not being in school. So, anyway, that's my that's my rant. Yeah, no, I understand. I'm I'm kind of the same way. I'll, I I realize though that having gone to do some pretty, you know, admittedly some pretty gru grueling jobs, like physically grueling jobs, you know, when I went back to school, I no longer had the problems that I had when I was younger. You know, like I I couldn't study, I couldn't focus, I couldn't get out of bed, couldn't go to classes, couldn't be arsed. You're wasting tons of money. And then I left, came back, and I was like, school is really fucking easy. I can just blow through this. It's nothing like, you know, working machinery or lifting heavy shit eight hours a day. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, school was like a cushy, a cushy side project almost the second time I went to it. Yeah, that's fair. Obviously, if you struggle with, like, motivation or you have a bad environment or something, like, coming back to school definitely makes uh, sense in that regard. Um, but for me, at least, like, it was almost purely just, like, it didn't really matter what the environment was. It was just like, man, I just want to get this over with <laughs> as quick as possible. <laughs> yep. Because yep. I'll never come back if I get a taste of freedom. So Let's see. So for for 50 MXN, 50 Mexicans? What? what, what, what pesos. What? Uh, pesos. <laughs> yeah. well, well, why is it MXN if it's a peso? Well, because it's like, you know, like a lot of currencies, uh, it, it, that's how they denominate it, you know? Like, yeah, but... It'll be like MXN to tell you the the country that it's from that's a little easier because a lot of countries use pesos you know okay, like yeah, argentina okay. yeah you know bolivia mm -hmm. a lot of countries uh call their currency a peso but it's like what which peso are you talking about okay so this this fellow for 50 pesos says i'm no ancap but his democracy will solve it argument is cope his criticism of the private options are the status quo 
Um, no, I mean, I, I, I disagree, right? Because I, I don't think uh, I don't think you have a problem. I mean, p- people criticize more so the over policing of, of poor areas riddled with crime rather than the under policing. <laughs> and so I think that we, we certainly would see under policing in an area with purely private police um, with regards to my faith in democracy. I mean, I think democracy has proven to be a fairly robust structure to govern many aspects of our society. Um, you know, there's a, a faint, you know, somewhat famously, there's never been a famine in a democracy, like a truly democratic state has never had a famine. Um, there have been many examples where, uh, you know, violence and sort of political, um, you know, political freedoms and economic freedoms have been extended because of democracy, right? Positive liberty certainly seems like that's most compatible with a democratic system. So, you know, no, I, I think uh, I think democracy does actually, in and of itself, solve a lot of problems. It's not a end all be all, but I think uh, democratic structures and democracy certainly solves a lot of problems. But the nimbyism in the voting, people don't vote for well, things that well, are I good. Mean, the, the solvency <laughs> for nimbyism is just a broader democracy, right? You know, passing laws that say that you can't, you know, local lo- localities cannot zone. For certain things or you know passing you know state laws that say you know we're gonna have this form of tax or vacancy tax or this limitation on certain forms of investing and stuff like that i mean you know it seems like a broad broader democratic accountability actually solves a lot of the nimbyism uh, problems well th- but now you're just centralizing more power into fewer hands and you have more points of failure in your system and it's much more easy for it to become tyrannical well hey i mean when uh you know when you can centralize a system and make a market freer as a result, um, to me, I'm not sure if that's necessarily a centralization of, of power and authority. Um, rather, it seems to be breaking up that power uh, and holding that power a little bit more directly accountable. So, you know, I think uh, at least at least with NIMBYism, that's an example where I think a broader democratic accountability to those types of policies makes a lot of sense. I think fascism is superior, Econoboy. And you have failed. Oh, to we show. already knew that, Dev. You have Everyone already knew that. Sh- All right. <laughs> Where's your uniform, Dev? <laughs> Everyone is going to have to wear flash shirts in the future. That's how it's going to be. Flash shirts. That, that's just. just... <laughs> well, that, that's what um my original artist drew because I happened to be wearing a flash shirt at the time. Oh right. Yeah, it, it just stuck. It there was no reason for it. It just stuck. <laughs> Okay, let's see here. That thunder symbol means something entirely different then. <laughs> there, there will be two thunderbolts on the shirt, actually. <laughs> no, three. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. What, what's next? What's next? Um, Coyote Doge for $5. Thank you. How did things get invented before copyrights and patents? I assume they just did. You just couldn't monetize them as easily. Um, that seems like it's kind of obvious. Well, people like Edison stole a lot of... Did he? Was uh, he a big old thief? He he stole a lot of inventions, too, apparently. Allegedly. Mm. (laughs) I haven't heard anything about that, but maybe. I don't don't know much about Edison, to be honest. Edison, he invented a light bulb, right? Um, Uh, He he was the first that popularized. Okay. Okay. The Um, making of it, I think. Oversized Trash Panda for $5. Thank you. Taxation is theft. But seeing as the theft I would experience under a warlord mafia in an anarcho hellscape would probably be worse, I'm okay with it. Yeah, that's kind of my argument, too. It's like, you, you, you don't have a no theft option. You have a little bit of theft or a lot of theft. And it's like, which one do you want? It's like, okay, fair enough. You know, that, that's, that's how I view it as well. Um, Dr. Topo is asking me when my trucker video is coming out. I have a video that's been brewing for a long time on the February trucker protests in Canada. That will come when uh, yes. it comes. That will come when it comes. I it's it's gonna be a long one. Like it's it's I predict it'll be like at least an hour probably longer because I'm getting into the nitty gritty of it. Yeah, get into how Trudeau's a tyrant. Yes. And the wrong kind of tyrant. Uh, they're, they're, listen, there are good fascists and bad There's fascists, a... okay? <laughs> <laughs> a good fascist being you in power. Yes. That's how it is. Bad fascist beating anything else. Wasn't that why Taftaj causes her? She she calls her, her community the the yeah the Taftatorship. She knows what's going on. She has the right idea. Okay, um, let's see. Oversized trash panda ten dollars. In high school, I found an SSC post called the Non Libertarian FAQ. 
And while I disagree with what with plenty of what it had to say, it clearly debunked all of this base level markets are good though in this video. Yeah, I I I, I don't know. In, in terms of you you've probably encountered more at least online and cap stuff than I have a Cono boy. In terms of just that, how how was this video? Um in turn like just how quality was it, I guess. Yeah. How good were the arguments? Yeah, I mean, I don't I I think that this is like the worst to me it's the worst <laughs> way to advocate for okay. anarcho capitalism. Okay. Um, you know, cuz cuz I mean, you know, when you're advocating for something, I mean, you're you know, ideally the what you're going to want to do if you're advocating for something is you're going to want to Number one, put it in terms that regular people can understand and also in terms that regular people can empathize with, right? And mm -hmm. I think that a lot of the um, ways that this video goes about explaining its concepts, to me at least, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it's accomplishing either one or both of those goals. Um, and so, um, yeah, that's to, to me at least, that's where it kind of falls apart a little bit. Mm. Okay. Maybe um, because Dev put the video fast. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it was, yeah. I mean, I some of the, well, the the ANCAP writing that I've read, like we're talking books at that point, they're a bit more eloquent. The ideas are a bit more appealing. Still don't agree with them, but I mean, I can get I can get what they're saying. This I don't know. This this didn't do it for me either. Um, I am wrong for five euros. Interesting name. You should watch Serpenza's video on Elon Musk's connections to the CCP. Okay, I can put that on the list if you like. I can look into it. Thank you. Um, Cody Doge for five dollars. We have he is a bit of a CCP defender. Is he? Oh, that's a shame. Um, we have regulations on opiates, and the official approval that opiates were safe because they got approval caused the epidemic. The FDA said they were safe. Oof. Well, yeah, I mean, the FDA said they're safe to take. Obviously, like opioids, you know, if you take if you take your prescribed amount of opioids, they're not going to kill you, right? Um, the issue with opioids is not that they're, you know, so damaging to your body that, you know, prescribing them for pain is going to kill you or, you know, harm your health long term. The issue is that they're so addictive and the control of the prescriptions for those things was so loose um, that a lot of people got opioid prescriptions when they shouldn't have. And then, you know, they ended up getting addicted and oftentimes ended up moving into harder substances like heroin or fentanyl. Um, right. You know, it's, uh, you know, it, it would be, it would be the same thing if uh, it would be, it, you know, there's, there's similar examples that I could probably think of if given more time, but it's just, uh, you know, op opioids are not bad for you intrinsically. Um, it's just that they are very addictive. And so when prescribed them, it should only be for cases where, you absolutely need them, and especially, uh, you know, probably you should only be given them for a shorter period of time. But that's an example where you need more regulation, not less. Mm. Okay, I can see that, yeah. Yeah, because, I, mean, I mean, again, I just had, you know, I tell people, you know, imagine a world where there were literally no requirements at all for getting opioids and consuming them. <laughs> I mean, this is a world where, I mean, instead of, what, what is it, uh, 10, 10, you know, five figure, uh, what, yeah, yeah, no, no, six, no, not six figures. Five figures worth of people die every year related to opioids. I mean, imagine if it was ubiquitously available. You know, I mean, I, yeah, be, but imagine the yeah. good shit you could get. <laughs> the good <laughs> shit. Imagine the fucking high. The good you could shit. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, yeah. I would no, love the opportunity. I, mean, that, I, I would love the opportunity to head over to <laughs> Demon Mama's house and get the best possible opioids out of her fucking bathtub, dude. That'd be great. Yeah. I mean, that, that's that's where I differ from a lot of like pure libertarians. Like, I don't think fully legalizing drugs makes sense because, you know, on the on the axes of like, you know, addicting and then bad for you. So you've got like Y axis addicting X axis. How bad is it for you? There are some substances that are so far onto the top right corner of that graph that they just shouldn't be allowed to be legally sold. Right? Now, I don't think anybody person. should go to jail yeah. for yeah, nobody should go to jail for doing drugs. I think that if, if you're addicted to something, I don't think prison is a way to solve that problem. But when it comes to, like, openly distributing that drug and manufacturing it, no, I mean, that should be illegal and certainly in some circumstances. So, yeah. Or in the case of opioids, like... Mm -hmm. it, it's it's the difference between the between weed and effect. heroin. You know, weed's fine, heroin will fucking destroy everyone. So, like, maybe we shouldn't allow heroin. Right. 
yeah they, they both chill you out but one will <laughs> you know ruin your life basically so yeah. yeah um let's see here Silver Camaro for five dollars. Thank you. It's kind of like how the left shows the few clips of cops doing bad things and pretend that, that somehow re represents all cops as a whole. That's true. Yeah, and in, in that's like the inverse of the libs of TikTok with like the 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 LGBT teachers thing. You know, there's always bad apples, but simply shining a spotlight on the bad apples makes people think that they're they're more normal than they are or more common than they are. Let's say. Yeah, I agree with that. You know, not not all cops are bad. Um. Ren McManus for five dollars. The problem is that we are not implementing any standard rules for what is or is not appropriate. I think that has to do with the um, the teachers' conversation from the beginning as well. Um, you know, yeah. hey, listen, all you all you rightoids in the chat right now, guys, you're here talking about the teachers. That involves more government regulation. In a free market, you would have teachers indoctrinating all your kids. With the most LGBT shit you can imagine, you're you're asking for more. You're asking. Depends, but hey, <laughs> it's a mixed bag. <laughs> you are asking for more government regulation on the teachers, guys. Come on. <laughs> okay, let's see. Hey, that is true. That is advocating mm -hmm. for restrictions on their freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Durka Durka, five dollars. Will Econo Boy disavow? That, hold on, wait, hold on, wait, this is a bit strangely worded. Hold on. There's, there's, a, there's a disavowal coming, though, apparently. Will a Econo boy disavow? <laughs> disavow now! Will, will you disavow teachers teaching sex acts and telling kids that gender isn't real? Yeah, um, so, again, I think that when we were talking about I just have to know what you mean when you say teaching sex sex, because it seems like some conservatives are of the, you know, some conservatives are of the opinion that, like, even a very basic sexual education is, um, what do you call it, um, you know, in, in, inappropriate, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, you know, for instance, like, a, you know, an adult touching, like, a young boy's penis, like, that's a sex act, right? But if I tell a kid, hey you know, like if I'm a teacher of a six or seven, you know, year old class of students or whatever, and I say, you know, to the boys, because at least in, in my sex education, sex education was actually segregated. So it was like the boys go in one room and the girls go in another. Um, and, um, you know, if I'm in a room full of boys and I say, you know, hey, you know, if a grown person touches your penis, uh, you know, that is not okay. And you should tell a trusted adult about that, you know, a teacher or a, a police officer, or your parent mm -hmm. or something like that about that. Um, like I'm telling them about a sex act, but you know, that's the uh, different, um, yeah. the, chat is not, to, um, the chat is now saying, he's saying, no, he's, he won't do it. He won't disavow. He won't do it. Oh God. Well, I mean, I think I said already earlier in the stream, right. Which was that, you know, we, we seem to all agree that if you're teaching kids like explicit sexual material, right. If you're, you know, yeah, showing yeah. them like the equivalent of porn or, or saying like, that whatever, whatever that book was where, like, the girl's blowing a guy and getting jizz all over or something. Oh, fuck. Like, oh, my God. That yeah, was like, ridiculous. Jeez, I remember yeah, like, seeing that's that. that's obviously not appropriate for, you know, a six- or seven-year-old, right? Yeah. For young yeah. kids, that would be, like, mm -hmm. that would be crazy. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, yeah, like, explicit sexual acts, the answer is no. Like, I would not I, – I, I do not think the school should be <laughs> teaching kids, like, fucking okay. what doggy style and shit is and like you know facials and stuff but okay. um okay there's yeah what was else. the what was the second part of the there's question some, there, there's, there's like no, two parts we're running out of time so i'm just going to ask you this do you i think oh, it says shit. like uh gender teaching, is, teaching, teaching kids that gender, gender isn't, isn't real. real yeah i don't know does that even happen yeah, teaching, i don't think that even happens i, I haven't yeah, heard anything that about that i don't know yeah <laughs> I mean, gender is well, obviously probably real. probably the so. same thing. Like, there, I'm, there might I'm be... sure maybe some yeah. crazy ones, too. I haven't seen evidence of it. I, I've looked. I haven't seen evidence of that. Yeah. One. yeah. It might be the same thing where, like, maybe there's some school districts that have different, you know, sort of nebulous policies in that regard. Um, so, like, I don't know. Like, I, I don't... Um, so, so I don't, I don't know most people that would say gender is not real. The question is just, is gender a social construct, right? And mm -hmm. for me, I don't really see a big problem with teaching kids, like, Hey, some people, um, some people have penises and they identify as non-binary, and their pronouns are they them. Like I just, to me, that's a fairly descriptive understanding of the world that surrounds children. Um, 
that's not judging like whether or not people are correct in identifying as non-binary or identifying as trans. Um, but descriptively, it's like, hey, if you see someone who is like masculine presenting and they say they're non-binary, what does that mean, right? This is what that means. And this is how you should refer to that person, um, at least if you want to respect them. Um, I don't really, I just don't see the problem with that personally. That's a, that's a descriptive lesson. It's not assigning any morality or any weight to it. Econovoy, do you disavow penis inspection day? What is that? <laughs> I've never even heard of this. Are you serious? What's penis inspection day? No, what are you okay. talking about? Are you, you haven't heard of penis inspection day? Give me a second. Though. I mean, I can imagine uh, what it is. Penis but... inspection day Everybody it's not a meme. Everyone has penis inspection day. Everyone has penis inspection day at school. Okay, here we go. Give me a second. I'm going to pull it up. Here, you'll be able to see this. Connell boy, just take a look. There it is. And I'll pull it up on screen right. real quick so you can read this out, okay? <laughs> Mandatory penis inspection. Okay. Academy of Information Technology here it is, guys. and Engineering. Yes. All right. To all male students, faculty, and staff of Riverside High School, Loden County Public Schools are required to conduct, to conduct mandatory penis inspections on all male students, faculty, and staff in accordance with Health Code 9.51. This year's penis inspection will take place on Tuesday, March 12, 2019, during Connections. All circumcised males should report to the Guidance Suite in 217. All uncircumcised males should report to the Nurses Suite 106. There will only be one makeup date on March, Mar Monday, March 18th at 2.10 p.m. If you are un unable to attend either inspection date, a district official can arrange to meet with you at your own time. All male students must attend a penis inspection or they will not graduate. A traditional Western pass-or-fail method will be used in the inspection. Please ensure that all, <laughs> all penises are clean and orderly, as there will be no special circumstances. Note that a failing grade will be given. Note that a failing grade will be given to any individual with an erection. All right, guys. Yeah, I'm looking at this up. This this appears to just be like a prank. This isn't like a real. Like, like okay. Not a real thing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so there have I think since like 2009 or something penis inspection day. Is there, is there as a 4chan meme? And now like people have taken to posting very official looking notices in their high schools just to troll them, and it's been going for for yeah. a while now. It's pretty fun. It's pretty funny stuff. Anyway, listen, guys. Yeah, you guys, can probably get away with that. Like a, you know, people. Like making in like making a version of the onion, but like don't make it obvious mm -hmm. like irony, right? Uh, I bet a lot of people would end up posting your stuff like, oh my god, local Oregon public school, you know, makes kids do psychedelics in order to sympathize with drug dealers or something. Like, it, it's definitely a know. prank. The, yeah. the guy, something like that. the guy. <laughs> if you look at the signatures, it says Richard L. Dong, head penis inspector. <laughs> and the signature is a penis <laughs> I drawing. Didn't see that. That's okay. funny. I've got about five minutes, so I'm going to get through the rest of these super chats pretty quick, okay? Uh, Silver Camaro for $2. Right, I, watched, it, I watched Sonic 2 last night. It was really good. Yeah, I enjoyed that movie too. Um, Silver Camaro, again, for $2. Trap Hentai in Preschool, Giga Chad. Okay. Sounds good. I guess that's probably pretty based. It's pretty based. Um, um, oh, this is from Toot, $5. I think Toot is also a trans woman. Um, on one of your last streams, you misread when I said that I stand with JK. I meant John K, the, John K, the Ren and Stimpy creator and the world's greatest cartoonist. Wait, that, that's in reference to last week's show, Lil. No, two that's, weeks ago. I remember that. Two, two weeks ago. The, um, yeah. Okay. Well, we uh, have super chats, yes. Yeah. Jesso Havens, $5. Hey, Dev. Hey, Lilith. Hey, guest bather, Econoboy. Happy to watch you all tonight. Today has been a rough... Today has been rough. A soak in the tub is just what I need. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. Um, Silver Camaro, 78, for five bucks. Again, thank you, dude. You've, you've given a lot, man. Thank you very much. Um, horrible people like Shoe on Head, Hassan, and Vosh are spreading a bunch of anti-cop lies about their response before all the facts come out. I think that's in response to the shooting recently. Oh, yeah. We didn't talk um, gun control. We did not. And I don't know exactly what you're referring to. I'll have to look into it later. Um, 
<laughs> I'm a perfect judge of character. Hires Dave. Thanks, dude. Thanks. Thanks. Um, We've been talking about the cop response time thing, because I've seen some confirmation behind that. Oh, but, yeah? But it is still a developing story. Mm, yeah. I've read, like, reports, like, the cops going in to take their own kids out of before oh, stopping the shooter. You mean, you mean at a shooting? Hmm. Yeah, at the at the Texas shooting. Oh, the Texas thing. shooting. See, I've, I've actually been completely, completely unplugged from that one. I don't know what's going on with Texas shooting. I don't know anything about it. This is one story that I've I've missed, unfortunately. Or maybe fortunately, who knows. Um, and finally, yeah. Charlie for $5. Have you heard of Young Rippa 59? Dude is a big and cat with some solid morals. Even if I don't agree with him, hit him up if you can. Okay. I don't, I've never heard of him, but all right. Sounds good. Okay. I think that's everything. That's all of it. So, we've come to the end of the tub cast for another week. That was a lot of fun having you in the tub with us, Akana boy. So, yeah, yeah. what we're going to do at some point is when Lilith and I are actually doing this in a real hot tub, you're going to come visit us. And you're gonna actually be in the hot tub with us when we do an, a, a follow up stream. Yeah, sure. <laughs> it's gonna be Sounds great. To or you can just do a Skype. Not Skype. What, what am I, Boomer? Yes. The Discord call. No, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not a Boomer. One day we will we will be doing. <laughs> one day. One one day my office will be big enough in Ottawa that you can come and 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 be part of it, Lilith, for real. And then we can actually have like a set with it with a hot tub. And we'll do the show from the hot tub, actually, rather than just the sure. artwork. It's going to be awesome. But anyway, um, fun to me. thanks for being here yet again, Econo Boy. We should do it yet again in the future. We'll just keep doing it. Why not? It's fun. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. It's always fun, you know, to your audience. If uh, if you guys want to learn about economics from a filthy, so, you know, not socialist, but social democrat perspective, uh then, it's the same uh, thing to them, to come be Come on over to... <laughs> well, yeah, I guess so. You know, come on over to Econoboy on Twitch. But it's always fun talking to you, Dev. I enjoy our conversations. So Yes, yeah. I've, I've also I've found a lot of value in them, too. Okay. Oh, sorry? Oh, yeah, and it was nice meeting Econ. you as well, Lilith. Good meeting you. you. Good meeting you as well. Yeah. All right, guys, we'll 